Welcome back everyone to the Dark Forest. Since it's the last day basically that I'm gonna be rocking it here for the month of February as far as for the Dogman per se, I decided to go ahead and just put it all together for you in one video. Give you something to have a nightmare from, yeah. Anyways, make sure to download your favorite scary story on my Apple Podcast and Spotify, Tales from the Dark Forest, and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're new. Now let's get spooky. Five years ago, I became a park ranger. I won't include the location of this event. I don't want anyone seeking out the utter horrors I have seen in that forest. You think that you're prepared for whatever the forest might throw at you. You hear about the strange occurrences from other rangers, the missing persons cases, the unusual animals that are like nothing you have ever seen before. I was arrogant. I just blew off these stories the other more experienced rangers told me as nothing but paranoia or attempts to scare the new guy. But I was wrong. I was very wrong. I had to tell this event to someone, to warn people of the things that are out there hiding in those deep woods just waiting for that bold individual to walk right into their clutches. This is the reason I will never return to that forest and now live in a large city. I avoid the woods that I used to love for so much because I'm terrified of what I'll find in them, or what will find me. Three months into my time as a park ranger, it was the beginning of spring. For the past two weeks, I had been receiving strange reports about park visitors and a few fellow rangers. People had been seeing strange, warped-looking animals wandering about the park. The animals sighted often looked thin with patches of missing hair, had completely white eyes, were gaunt and almost skeletal, and the proportions of the animals were said to just seem wrong as if the animals were just not completely convincing copies of the animals they were supposed to be. Of course, most of us just assumed there was some sort of disease starting to affect the animals in the park. There was an old park ranger who had started at the park a month before the sightings started, named Briggs, who warned us that he had seen this before. He was worried, and insisting we should close up the park. He said, that the animals were dangerous and a safety hazard to anyone inside the forest, but he wouldn't say any more than that. He just always looked haunted when we would talk about those animals and said that the forest wasn't safe anymore. Of course, we just wrote him off as being a kooky paranoid old guy who had probably had some kind of traumatic wild animal attack experience. We didn't even entertain the possibility that he might be right, and our hubris would be our downfall. I still remember something Briggs said to me one day shortly before he quit working for the park. It was always so weird to me that Briggs was so disturbed by these animal reports, and looked so haunted when he talked about them. He was a big man in his late 70s, but he could have easily wiped the floor with any youngster who tried to step foot to him. He was an ex-Navy SEAL, and a tough and real smart son of a gun. I was surprised he was so superstitious and paranoid that we should close up the park when it just seemed like some outbreak of a disease amongst some of the wildlife. All in all, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. Briggs didn't say specifically why he was so insistent on closing up the park. All he would say to me on the subject was, There's things in that forest you can't comprehend, boy. Things that will break a grown man in two like a twig. They're smart, you know. We think we're the apex predator in this world, but we couldn't be more wrong. If you aren't afraid, you're a fool. They're coming out in droves and I don't know why, but I don't plan on being here to find out. I've seen the horrors of war, Sonny, and what I saw on the battlefield is nothing compared to what I've seen in that forest. Do the wise thing and listen to this old timer before it's too late. I just wrote off what Briggs told me, but now I wish I hadn't. If I could, I would go back and change what I've done, but it's too late now. 
and the horrors I saw will stick with me as long as I live. One week after Briggs warned us to close down the park, he quit and left the park behind. He was the smart one. He knew what was coming and didn't want to be around when all hell broke loose. I saw a glimpse of one of those strange animals on one of my patrols within that week, but it just looked like a sick raccoon to me. I thought nothing of it, and it was gone before I could attempt to catch it. But within five weeks of these sightings beginning, things had started to become stranger. We have had ten reports from park visitors of being attacked by these sickly-looking animals. All of them had told us the same thing. The animals seemed intelligent now, like they were hunting them. They seemed intelligent, and they seemed angry. We were bewildered and unsure of what to make of the situation. We have been trying to hunt down and put down the sick animals since the report started. We decided it was wiser to put down these animals to keep the sickness from spreading, but the animals remained inclusive. The most any of us were able to do was catch occasional glimpses of them. But that all changed one night, in the sixth week of the sightings. We'd also had ten missing persons cases brought to our door within the past two weeks. Though we were unsure if this was attached to the sick animal sightings and were unable to find any traces of the missing people aside from some abandoned belongings and campsites. On a seemingly peaceful summer night, three of us were at the ranger station on an overnight shift. It was myself, Hank, a tough hulking man in his early 30s, and Lita, a petite girl in her late teens, who was interning at the park over the summer. We had increased employee presence in the park due to the strange animal behavior of the past two or so months. It was close to ten at night when we had a historical young blonde woman rushing into our station. She was covered in dirt and scratches, her clothes in tatters. She looked wild, like someone who had been lost in the forest for weeks. She was sobbing, babbling, and collapsed into the arms of Hank. I started to check for her and treat her injuries as we tried to calm the woman down enough for her to speak clearly. After about an hour, we managed to calm her down enough for her to be able to speak in somewhat coherent sentences. She was still hard to understand, but we managed to get the gist of what she had to say. The woman told us that she had been camping in the park with her four friends. They had set up camp in the morning, and everything seemed normal. But after the sun set, things started to become strange. They started to hear odd noises coming from the forest, and swore that they even heard talking. Though the voices sounded garbled and growled, almost like someone who still wasn't completely sure how to form words. They started to feel on edge and had decided to leave first thing in the morning, but were too scared to venture out into the forest in the middle of the night with the strange noises they were hearing. She told us, after an hour of hearing the strange noises coming from the forest, a stumbling and almost hairless sickly gaunt coyote with pure white eyes came out of the forest and started venturing into the clearing where they had set up camp. The coyote was making strange noises like it was in pain, and the closer it got, the easier it was for them to see the coyote seemed off. She said that the coyote seemed just a little too long and too tall to be a coyote, like it had been stretched or something. As the coyote got closer, her friend Trace got scared and decided to throw a rock at the coyote to scare it off. Instead of throwing the rock near the coyote, he threw a fist-sized rock at the coyote and hit it square in the head. The rock hit the coyote and it collapsed to the ground. After the rock hit the coyote, the forest seemed to go completely still, almost like time had stopped. The only sounds the five of them could hear were their own terrified breathing and the crackling of the campfire. They thought Trace had killed the coyote, 
In their ear silence, they could see it wasn't breathing. But then, the coyote's body jerked. Strange cracking noises can be heard from the coyote's body as it twitched and contorted. Its body changed into an almost humanoid shape as it rose up on two legs. The coyote bared its teeth at the five of them in a sneer and then opened its mouth. They heard the coyote speak two chilling words in a deep guttural voice. Feeding time. These two words seemed to send the forest into chaos as creatures of varying shapes and sizes swarmed from the tree line upon the five campers. Not all of the animals even seemed to look like animals or anything the girl had ever seen before. The creatures dragged the five of them through the forest to a cave, dragging them inside to what seemed to be a dark and massive cave system. This is something I found strange considering that the only caves we had in this park were relatively small. There should have been nothing in that park like what this girl was describing. She told us that the animals dragged them into this cave system and trapped them in some kind of sticky, wispy substance that seemed to be like spiderwebs, but with the strength of thick rope. She said that she could barely remember what happened after that, since she couldn't see in the pitch-black cave. All she could hear was the occasional screams of terror and pain from her friends, and the squelching noises of what she knew were her friends being eaten. She wasn't sure how long she was in there. What she guessed was that every few days, one of them would be taken and fed upon by what she could only guess was the creatures that took them into the caves. The creatures also would force-feed her water and food every so often. Though it was clear, they only fed her enough to keep her alive. She said she was fed some kind of mush she had never been able to identify, only that it tasted utterly foul and almost like something rotten. When it was finally her turn to be eaten, she got lucky. She felt the threads that bound her being cut by what seemed to be some large claw or knife, and then she crashed to the cave floor. In a panic, she managed to grab a large rock. She struck out of the darkness towards where she believed to be the thing that had cut her loose. She could tell that she made contact with something and heard a growl of pain as the creature hit the ground. She didn't wait to figure out how much damage she had done. She had just ran. She ran for what felt like hours. She could hear the sounds of growls and what seemed to be the garbled speech she couldn't understand all around her. But somehow, she managed to avoid the creatures who were hunting for her. She managed to escape the cave system and just ran blindly through the forest in the dark until she found the ranger's station. After finishing the story, she just bursted into sobs and begged us to protect her from the monsters that she thought were still chasing her. We realized after hearing her story that she was part of a group of five campers who had gone missing in the forest two weeks earlier. It was a group of college students who had come to the park on summer break, but after the first day of their camping trip, their families and friends had stopped hearing from them. After three days of no contact from the students, we had been notified that these campers were to be considered officially missing. We had been contacted by the families even earlier than that, and had run some preliminary searches, but... Like the five other missing persons that had cropped up in the past two weeks, we had only found an abandoned campsite and belongings from the campers. After closer inspection of the girl and asking for her name, we managed to identify her as one of the two missing girls, Abigail. At the time, we believed that Abigail and her friends were likely drugged and attacked by some dangerous individuals in the forest. It was easier to think that Abigail had just crafted this unbelievable narrative as a way to comprehend what had happened to her, while kept heavily drugged and docile. After all, 
once sane and responsible person could honestly believe the wild tale Abigail had spun. We left Abigail to eat and discussed amongst the three of us for a bit about what to do with her. We were quick to decide that the best course of action was to notify law enforcement that we had found Abigail, and that there were likely a group of dangerous individuals currently residing in the park. The three of us felt very disconcerted after hearing Abigail's story, but knew that we couldn't very well abandon our post in the early hours of our shift. At this point, we all just wanted to get Abigail somewhere safe and really wanted to leave the park, even though we couldn't. First, I tried to call the police through the office phone, but the line was dead. That far out, in the middle of nowhere, phone service can be notoriously unreliable, so our mobiles couldn't be used to call the police either. The office phones were really our best way of contact to the outside world, unless we felt like wandering about until we managed to possibly get a bar of service. With the phone lines down, we just decided to shut down for the night and take Abigail to the police station ourselves. As we were gathering our things and shutting off the lights for the night, we all moved with a mutual sense of urgency. Human instinct is a powerful thing, and at that moment, all of us seemed to sense that something was wrong. Suddenly, Abigail started screaming loud enough that I was sure she could actually crack the windows. She started pointing towards the window straight across from the couch she sat on and screaming, It's here! They're here! You have to help me! They're coming for me! Initially, I thought that the girl was just hysterical. That was until I saw it. The thing was exactly what Abigail had described. It was a too tall bipedal thing with gangly but muscular limbs and a patchy furred body. It had to be at least eight feet tall with the way its torso was, the only part initially visible when I looked out the window. When it crouched down and tapped its claw against the glass, it had the head of a coyote with those milky white eyes. It grinned and let out a growl. Come out! It purred in a gravely sing-song voice. Abigail screamed and backpedaled away from the window, hiding behind and latching on to Hank while yelling that we needed to escape and begging us not to let him take her. I was frozen in fear. I was in no way equipped to handle this. I was just an average guy from Iowa with no special skills to speak of, besides being decently athletic with an encyclopedic knowledge of the outdoors. The only thing I could do at that moment was stand frozen and staring in horror at the thing peering at us through the window and chuckling at our terrified faces. Surprisingly, what snapped me out of my shell-shocked state was Lita. She was the only one out of us who didn't look scared. Instead, she looked angry. She smacked me across the face hard enough to leave my ears ringing. She then proceeded to do the same with Hank. Hank and I shared mirrored surprise expressions that Lita was so quick to action and that her small form could hit that hard. Get your shit together. We all need to get the hell out of here. Lita yelled at the three of us. She then proceeded to remove a black pistol from her backpack. A multitude of questions were rushing through my mind. At the top of that list was wanting to know what the hell that thing outside was. And right below that was bewilderment at Lita's 180 shift from a bobbly, perky teenager to acting like some battle-hardened veteran. I didn't have much time to spend on these musings, however, as we heard the window crack. The coyote thing had placed a hard punch to the window that had caused it to fracture. One more good hit would surely shatter it. Then Lita raised her gun and fired. The bullet shattered the window and sent the coyote crashing back to the ground. 
Hurry! Get to Hank's truck! And get your frickin' guns! Lita yelled. Hank and I already had our shotguns out and ready due to the reports of animal attacks. So we were able to snatch them up quickly as Lita took the lead to head to the front door. Abigail continued to stick close to Hank silently with wide, terrified eyes as we moved cautiously for the door. Lita threw open the door, and I was shocked at what we were faced with. There were at least 30 of those warped animals we had heard so much about. And at the head of them was that coyote with a now missing left arm and the shoulder stump looking like it healed years ago. The coyote was the only one in a bipedal form. The other animals looked warped in various shapes and sizes, some being recognizable animals and others simply looked like horrifying beasts I had never seen before. The only thing that they had in common was those white eyes. The coyote snarled and seemed to focus its attention on Lita. You'll pay for that, it growled out. Lita sneered at the coyote in response. Shove it, you overgrown flea bag. She shot back as she reached into her backpack and produced a flare which she was quick to light and hold out in front of her. The creatures recoiled at the light and the coyote let out a deep, unearthly growl. She hurled the flare into the crowd of animals and then scattered with unnatural speed back from the flare. Go! Lita yelled, and the four of us made a break for it to the parking lot while we had the opening. Lita took the lead, taking a shot at any of the creatures who tried to leap at us as we ran. Her bullets seemed to have strange effects on the creatures. The moment they hit black liquid bubbled from their injuries and the things would screech in pain as their bodies seemed to start to dissolve into a black liquid. Hank and I took a few shots at the things, but our bullets didn't seem to do much other than knock the creatures back briefly. When we did get to the truck, we all piled in quickly and Hank was in the driver's seat and he gunned it towards the exit to the park right after the engine roared to life. I let out a breath of relief as I thought we were home free. Don't start relaxing. We're not out of the woods yet. Lita scolded me and then offered a hint of a smirk at a terrible joke she'd made. I looked at her in disbelief for a moment before an uneasy chuckle escaped from Hank and me, appreciating an attempt to calming the three of us at least. Lita's smirk quickly faded as she focused her attention on the blurry view of the forest outside the car as Hank sped along the road. So, what the hell are you? Hank asked as he kept his eyes focused on the road, but it was clear the question was meant for Lita. It was an unspoken question that had been hanging in the air ever since Lita jumped into action the deal with the coyote thing back at the ranger station. I'll tell you what, Hank. I'll give you a nice lengthy explanation after we're out of the forest full of those things itching to get us. Sound good? She responded faintly. Hank gave a sign in response. Fine, fine, fair enough. Do you at least know what those things are? He pressed. Yes, Lita said shortly. Then she signed heavily. All you need to know is that they're really hard to kill, and if you want to bring them down, you gotta aim for their vitals. They won't stop moving until their bodies are completely destroyed. Their eyes are sensitive to light, and they'll naturally flee from it. Fire also does a nice job of doing heavy damage to them. You manage to engulf one in flames, and they'll go up like a bonfire dosed in gasoline but get back quick before they explode, unless you want to go smelling like roadkill that won't wear off for weeks. The exception to the flame roll is that coyote thing. Fire will hurt it, but it's not enough to kill it. If something messes up, you leave me to deal with the coyote thing while you focus on escaping. If the coyote thing gets taken out, and the small animals will stop attacking... They'll still be those things, but they won't be coordinated anymore. 
so it'll give you the opening you need to get out, she explained. I stared at Lita with wide eyes, wondering how exactly it was she knew all this. I could tell Hank was wondering the same thing, but it was clear that this was all Lita was willing to tell us at the moment. Abigail remained quiet in the back seat with me. She was just staring out the window with wide, vacant eyes. Not that I could blame her after what she had been through. I guess she just needed some time to process everything. Before I could speak up and ask Abigail anything, I heard a loud metallic crunch and then we were airborne. I caught a flash of brown fur before the truck tumbled off the road, rolling down a steep hill and came to a rest on its roof, having been stopped by a large pine tree. I sat suspended in the air by my seatbelt with my ears ringing and my body trying to process the shock of the crash. I was snapped out of my dazed state by Lita cursing loudly. Shoot! The truck is screwed! She huffed out as she unclicked her seatbelt and crashed onto the roof of the car. Is everybody okay? She asked as she shifted to look at the rest of us. Lita had a deep cut on her right cheek and forearm with some various cuts and bruises scattered across her form as well, but she seemed mostly unharmed. I'm okay, I think. I choked out before undoing my seatbelt as well and hitting the roof of the car with a faint grunt. Aside from some cuts and being sore as hell, I was fine as far as I could tell. Hank was similarly mostly unharmed, aside from a thick bit of glass that had gotten stuck in his left bicep, but that was able to be quickly tended to by Lita by taking the glass out and tearing off a bit of his sleeve to tie around the wound. Abigail appeared to have passed out from the crash. She had a few deep gashes on her forearms and some smaller scratches, but otherwise, she seemed unharmed. However, she was unconscious, and it was difficult to assess how she really was until she woke up. Something odd I noticed about her that I wish I had paid more attention to was that her blood looked almost black but I just assumed I was seeing things because of the poor lighting and already being very on edge. Hank and I gently removed Abigail from the wreckage of the truck, while Lita surveyed the damage and tried to figure out exactly where we were. The truck was an absolute wreck. The passenger side had collapsed inward like something heavy had impacted with it and the resulting roll down the hill and crashing into the pine tree had completely totaled the truck. We were lucky the truck was as sturdy as it was, or we would have surely walked away with worse injuries than we had. We'll have to continue on foot from here, Lita said before placing a hand over Abigail's mouth and giving her a smack across her cheek to see if it would wake her up. Abigail woke with a start, but her resulting scream was muffled by Lita's hand over her mouth. Once Abigail took in her surroundings, Lita tore the sleeves off her shirt and used them as a cloth to treat Abigail's wounds on her forearms. Come on, we need to get moving before they catch up with us, she barked. The three of us followed behind Lita, with Abigail in between the three of us, considering her unarmed and mostly unresponsive state. We all moved at a brisk walking pace, sticking to the shadows of the tree line but never completely leaving the view of the road, just in case a car happened to come by. For a while, we were able to continue on without interruption. The forest was almost completely quiet, not even a sound from the insect could be heard. The only sounds we could hear was the occasional howl or growl in the distance, and the sounds of our footsteps and heavy breaths. Despite the terrors of the night, this was perhaps one of the most terrifying parts to me, that utter quiet, and the sense that at any moment one of those things could rush from the force to do God knows what. Then the silence was broken, as a thing that resembled a large deformed porcupine the size of a wolf rushed at us from the underbrush. Lita fired off a bullet into the creature's chest before it could make contact, and it screeched and quickly started to dissolve on the ground. 
Then the sounds of more growls and rushing footsteps can be heard as reinforcements rush towards the area. Attracted by the gunshot and the screeches of pain from the porcupine-like creature. Run! Lita yelled before breaking off into a sprint. The three of us quickly followed with Abigail pulling ahead of Hank and myself despite her frail condition. She had enough sense to at least not run out ahead of Lita, but her swift movements were startling. At the time, I chalked it up to adrenaline. We ran with the sounds of those creatures pursuing us, filling the forest area around us. Lita, Hank, and I fired off the occasional shot when one of those things tried to jump at us from the forest, but we managed to keep ahead of the creatures. Or at least, that's what we thought anyways. As we emerged out into a large clearing, the moonlight illuminated the coyote who seemed to be even larger than the last time we had seen it. Though its left arm was still missing, behind it stood a large half-circle of those creatures of numbers of at least fifty who all stood waiting, hissing and snarling as if they desired nothing more than the charge and tear us apart. Lita didn't hesitate to raise her gun and took a shot at the coyote, but when she did, all that sounded was an empty click. She was out of bullets. Crap, she said softly under her breath quickly reaching to the side pocket of her backpack as if reaching for more ammo. Before she could reach the side pocket, a squirrel-like thing the size of a large dog came crashing down from the tree above and smacking into her back. Lita cursed as she struggled against the creature, but it held firm. Hank raised his shotgun to try to shoot the squirrel creature off of Lita, but as he made that move, he was knocked to the ground by the small, frail form of Abigail. She had landed a hard elbow to the ribs that caused a loud crunch. Hank groaned in pain as he instinctively curled into himself, and Abigail took the opportunity to pin him to the ground on his stomach with a too wide grin settling on her features that showed sharp teeth. Her eyes were white now like the other frickin' things. As she held him, her body started twisting and crunching as her limbs grew longer and distorted with her skin taking on a papery white shade with a gray ting. She bit into the side of Hank's neck and he let out a pained gargling sound as she took a chunk out of the side of his neck. Damn it, Hank! Lita yelled as she struggled still against her captor. Then she looked at me with an instinct gaze. Get out of here! She roared with the tang of desperation in her voice. In that moment, my survival instincts took over and I listened. It was as if my body went in autopilot while my mind raced. I thought that I couldn't just leave Lita and Hank behind. I had to stay and try to save them. But even as I thought this, I kept running like my body had a will of its own separate from my mind. I tore through the forest everything fading into a blur as I focused on what was ahead of me. I don't know how long I ran for, but eventually, I felt something heavy crash into me. I hit the ground roughly and felt the wind being knocked out of me. I briefly saw the shadowed outline of a hulking figure before I fell unconscious from the hard impact. When I woke up, Everything was still dark. I wondered if I was even still alive. All I knew was that it was dark and I couldn't move. Then I heard a groan from nearby. Ah, shit. I heard Lita's voice say softly before I heard a slight rustling like someone was struggling. Lita? I croaked out in question and I heard her gasp from nearby. Thank frickin' goodness you're still alive, she breathed. Then she let out a more frustrated sound. But that means you got caught. Look, I have a plan to get us out of here, but you need to do exactly what I say if you want to survive this, she said in a hushed tone. What about Hank? I whispered back, and Lita was quiet for a moment before she spoke up again. 
Hank's beyond saving now. You, you don't want to know, trust me. She said with a pained whisper. Now stop talking. You don't want them knowing you're awake. And whatever you do, don't let them feed you anything, she said with a renewally steeled tone. I did as I was told and shut up after that. I don't know how long we stayed in that darkness. I could feel myself suspended in the air and completely unable to move. It felt like I was wrapped up in some kind of cocoon made of a sticky substance similar to that of a spider web. It was exactly the same conditions that Abigail had described in her story. The only sounds I heard all the time were the occasional shuffling, which I assumed to be Lita, and the distant sound of footsteps and soft growls. After what could have been hours, or even days, of just staying silent in that oppressive darkness, I heard a ripping noise, and then a loud thunk and a grunt. I wanted to speak but remembered Lita's words and forced myself to remain quiet. I just waited and hoped that that was the sound of Lita escaping. I heard footsteps approaching me and held my breath while attempting to press myself back against the stone wall behind me on a deep-rooted instinct to cringe away from the unknown thing that approached. Then I heard a ripping noise shortly before my bindings gave away, and I went crashing to the rock floor below. While I laid there with the wind knocked out of me, Lita ripped the sticky binds away from me and I quickly scrambled to my feet. You're going to have to trust me. Stay close to me and I'll get you out of here, Lita whispered in my ear. I nodded before realizing she couldn't see me in the pitch black darkness and instead whispered back, Okay. It was all I could say at the moment. I heard a strange crunching noise and then Lita grabbed my hand and started to swiftly lead me along as if she was able to see where she was going. I noticed that her nails felt sharper than before as she held tight to my hand. I felt fear bubble up as I wondered if she was becoming something like what Abigail had turned into, but I forced myself to bury that fear. Right then, Lita was my only chance of making it out of that place. I had to trust her. I didn't have any other option. We moved through the darkness for what seemed like forever. We seemed to be moving through some sort of massive tunnel or cave network, like the one from Abigail's story. We could mostly move with hurried steps, but on various occasions, Lita would stop me and pull me into one of the crevices or side tunnels when the sounds of footsteps neared us. Then after the footsteps faded, we would continue on our way again. I began to wonder if we would just be wandering this cave network until we finally just collapsed. I could already feel the hunger, dehydration, and exhaustion gnawing at me. But I kept pace with Lita, forcing myself to keep walking, even when it felt like my legs were turning to stone. Then, I finally saw a beautiful sight. There was light streaming in the stony area about 15 feet ahead of us after we had turned a corner. As we drew closer to the light, I could see that it was the moonlight streaming into a large hole of some sort that looked to have been dug by massive claws. The hole was roughly about 5 feet above us and led into some kind of tunnel to the surface. I felt my heart sink as I realized there was no way we could reach the hole to escape through it we would have to continue on back into the darkness. I'll boost you up to the edge of the hole. Do you think you could pull yourself out? Lita spoke up as I let myself fall into a crestfallen state. I looked at Lita's petite five-foot form in bewilderment. I felt my eyes widen as I was finally able to take in her appearance. Lita's form had changed. She had grown more muscles, and she looked practically feral. Her short black hair was wild and she was covered in dirt, but she looked uninjured despite her dirty appearance and very torn, blood-stained clothing. Her nails had turned to claws, and when she spoke, I could see her teeth had changed the sharpened points. When I finally met her eyes, they were no longer that piercing hazel green they had been. 
Now her pupils had changed to slits and her eyes were a glowing gold shade. I instinctively took a few steps back from her as I took in her inhuman features, and she firmly grabbed my wrist. Now isn't the time. I told you, if you want to make it out of this, you're going to have to trust me, she said firmly. I slowly nodded, and she released me in return. Then she laced her fingers together and placed her palms upward to allow me to step on them so she could lift me up into the hole. I complied, and she lifted me with a surprising ease. I dug my fingers into the dirt and scrambled my way up through the hole to the outside of the forest above. I collapsed onto the ground on my way, taking in deep lungfuls of air for a moment to let out a short laugh of relief to be away from the horrid darkness. Then I remembered Lita. I looked down through the hole that appeared to be an animal burrow hidden beneath a large thick bush from the outside. Lita looked up at me with glowing golden orbs before she jumped upwards and dug her clawed hands into the dirt. I grabbed her hands and helped pull her out of the hole though I'm not entirely sure if she needed my help at all. Once we were both out in the forest, Lita held a hand up when she saw me about to speak. No questions. Not until we're out of here. Don't talk. Just follow and do as I say. That's how you're going to make it to see sunrise, she said in a voice that left no room for argument. I just nodded in response to let her know I understood. She nodded back, and then we were off. The forest was still as strangely quiet as it had been when we were captured, and I wondered if it was even the same night anymore. I had no idea how many days had passed since we were taken down into the cave network. We could have been down in that cave system for days for all I knew. We just walked in silence as the moon moved across the sky. I didn't ask her where we were going. All I knew what to do at that point was to follow Lita and hope that she had a plan. Lita seemed to tense some as we walked, but she said nothing beyond making a circular upward motion with her hand that I took to mean as, be on your guard. You're quite the clever little girl. Such a shame that you chose the wrong side of this war. A deep rumbling voice spoke that seemed to echo around us. Lita let out a soft growl in response. Yeah? If you're so upset about it, then why don't you come and handle me yourself? Unless you're too scared to face me directly. You seem pretty chicken shit with the way you have all your lackeys do all the fighting for you. She barked back, which earned cold laughter from the voice which I assumed to belong to that coyote, since it was the only one of the creatures I had heard actually speak up to that point. Then... A dark shape seemed to emerge from a nearby oak tree that quickly shifted and turned the form of that coyote I was beginning to grow familiar with seeing. It was grinning at us with its head cocked to the side ever so slightly as if it was amused. As you wish. He said before he rushed at us with alarming speed. Lita was backhanded hard enough that she went flying through a number of trees which crashed to the ground as Lita skidded to a stop on all fours roughly 30 feet away. The deep gouges in her forearms she had gotten from the coyote's claws were already healing as she charged at the coyote. The coyote let out a roar that was mixed with laughter as Lita charged at it as if it was relishing the challenge that had been presented to it. The ensuing fight was one I only caught glimpses of as I attempted to distance myself from the two. I saw glimpses of Lita savagely tearing into the coyote and drawing inky black blood from the thing with every hit. She was superhumanly strong with the way she was able to send the coyote flying. It had grown to be at least twice her size by that point with a far more muscular figure than its previously gaunt form. The fight between the two seemed as if it would never end as they destroyed the forest around them. The time the two dealt injuries to the other would heal almost as fast as they were given. 
Trees fell all around the two, and slowly their battle zone had changed more into a clearing filled with jagged stumps and fallen trees. Despite Lita's strength, she still seemed out of her league against the coyote. As fast as she was able to heal, the coyote still dealt more damage than Lita, and seemed to land attacks on her far more often than she did to it. And yet, she never seemed to tire or give up. She just looked at the coyote with this deep-seated rage as he stubbornly continued to battle it. I stayed hidden behind a large rock on a small cliff near their battlefield. I should have ran, but I couldn't as I watched in horror, and yet almost wonder as the two superhuman entities clashed. I just silently hoped their fight would not come near to me as I knew I would only get in the way or get hurt in this battle between two things that were far beyond the strength of a normal human like me. I could already see Lita was facing a challenge against the coyote with it only having one arm and I wondered just how dangerous this thing would be without that handicap. Then I quickly pushed that thought away as I felt panic overtaking me at that idea. Whatever the hell this thing was, it was a monster of overwhelming strength that I could still barely fathom the existence of. Finally, the coyote got the upper hand, if you could even really call the hulking, patching, furry thing a coyote anymore. It managed to pin Lita to the ground with its massive clawed hand, holding her down by her throat and upper chest. Lita choked and gagged as she clawed and kicked at the coyote's arm and it just laughed at her, struggling even with their arms tearing chunks from its arm. I felt panic build up in my chest at the sight. I felt as if I had to do something to help Lita, but I had no idea what I could do. If Lita wasn't able to stop that thing, there was no way I stood a chance. But I decided that I couldn't just leave Lita to just perish at the hands of this thing. I had already lost Hank, I couldn't just stand by and lose her too. I picked up the heavy rock from the ground nearby and attempted to stealthily approach the coyote while its attention was focused on Lita. You make such delicious prey, little girl. Such a shame that you didn't last longer. It has been so long since I've been provided such a challenge. My compliments. Even your mother wasn't quite as strong as you. But alas, you'll suffer the same fate as she did. The coyote hummed with glee while Lita glared up at it with seething hatred in her expression. I'll kill you, she snarled back in a choking, gasping voice as she moved viciously attempting to struggle loose from the grip of this thing. Ah, still so spirited. I'm sure that fire in you will only make you even more delicious. The coyote chuckled, simply seeming amused by Lita's fury. The coyote opened its jaws wide as its face split into four even pieces, and opened like horrific flower petals to reveal a large black maw lined with white needle-sharp teeth, and out from its throat flickered a deep red tongue reminiscent of a massive octopus tentacle lined with suckers that had silver spikes in the center. I rushed forwards to hurl the rock right at its head of the creature and hopefully distract it long enough to get Lita free. The thing closed in as if aiming to bite in Lita with its monstrous mouth. I felt a sinking in my chest. I was too late. Even with Lita's astounding healing abilities, there was no way she could survive a head being bitten off. But then the thing's chest exploded in black gore as a loud bang sounded through the forest. Its body was soon torn apart by more explosions as more loud bangs filled the forest. Lita bolted to her feet as the creature's body started to dissolve into that black liquid that I had seen the other things dissolve into. Its head flopped to the ground and changed back to the more coyote-like shape. Somehow, it spoke, even with its head now being the only solid piece of it left. This isn't over. It hissed out. You haven't seen the last of me. We will have our victory. It gasped. 
then its head exploded in another burst of gore, and all that was left of the beast was puddles of black goo that quickly dried and floated up into the air in little black flakes as the sky started to change with the first shades of dawn. I felt the rock drop from my hands as a familiar voice spoke on the edge of the tree line. You sure made quite a mess out here, huh? I turned and couldn't believe my eyes. There Briggs stood with a shotgun in hand and a proud grin presented on his face. Lita gave Briggs a withering look in response. Took you long enough, Grandpa. Those damn reinforcements you promised were almost too late. We lost some good people while your jackass sat around here with your thumbs up your asses. She scolded the old man. I felt my mind begin to swim as I tried to process all the events that had transpired over the course of this terrifying affair. As I tried to take in the scene in front of me of all the heated back and forth between Lita and Briggs, all their voices sounded like to me were faraway echoes. Blackness started to form at the edges of my vision, and I felt a little unconscious. When I woke up, I was in the hospital in the nearest city to the state park. I was told I had been transported to the hospital from a clinic in a nearby town to the state park. According to the hospital staff, I had been brought in with deep gashes, dehydrated, and emancipated. I had apparently woken up and spoken delirious of monstrous animals attacking, so it was assumed I had been attacked by either a bear or a wildcat, based off my injuries and had become lost in the forest for days before eventually being discovered by two hikers. At first, I attempted to argue and recount what really happened, but I was quickly figured out that the hospital staff just assumed I was still delirious. They weren't going to believe me. I did discover that it had been a week and a half since the last night those things first attacked. After I was discharged from the hospital, I immediately quit my job at the state park. My supervisors didn't ask any questions. I saw that a missing person report had been filled for Hank, but no law enforcement ever questioned me about what happened at the park. In fact, there was never any reports at all of what happened in the park that night. And after that night, the strange animal sightings in the park just fizzled off soon after. I thought about going to the police and telling them my story about what had happened, but I knew that they would just ignore what I said. After all, who would believe such a strange story? I hadn't believed Abigail's at first. Surely, no one would believe me either. Since then, I moved across the country to a large city and an arid climate full of flatlands and desert. I want to be far away from any forest. I know that the media and law enforcement won't believe my story, but I recently heard about this subreddit from my girlfriend. She's the only one that I've told this story to since then. She's the only one who believes me. She encourages that I post this here. I think she hopes that it will be therapeutic for me. But I decided to post this story because I want to warn anyone who will listen. Watch out for the forests. There are things out in those deep woods far beyond human comprehension. Whatever I saw in that forest, I have no doubt there's more out there. I remember what it said to Lita. It mentioned a war. It said it would come back. The people that go missing out in the forests. The strange things that happen. Maybe there really isn't a logical explanation for all of it. So if you start to see animals that go wrong with those white eyes in the forest, get out while you still have the chance, or they might just come for you next. I hope that my tale will serve as a warning to all of you that choose to listen to it. I haven't seen Lita or Briggs since that night, and I could only hope that they're doing well wherever they are. While I still wonder what those things are that attacked that night, I'm too scared to really go looking for answers I want. As far as I'm concerned, I hope I never have to step foot into another forest again, but another part of me has started to become less scared over the years. I felt angry for all the horrors those things brought on. 
They killed innocent and good people like those college kids and Hank. I want to know what they are, and I want to stop them. There's a state park a few hundred miles away from me, and I've seen increasing reports of animal attacks and missing persons there lately. Maybe I should go there and warn them before things go too far. I sat on the story I wrote for a week. I wasn't sure to post it or not after giving it more thought. Yesterday, I got a visit from someone I thought I would never see again. I heard a knock on my apartment door and before me stood Lita. She didn't look like she had aged a day since the last time I saw her. She looked like how she did when I first met her. Tanned caramel skin, piercing hazel green eyes. A petite figure, five foot nothing, and jet black hair. The only difference was that her hair had grown down to her waist and was tied back in a messy braid. She looked up at me with an intense expression of hers before offering me an amused smile. We need to talk, she said simply. Of course I let her in. She just walked into my apartment like she owned the place and took a seat on my couch. Nice place you've got. A little plain. But you were always kind of a basic guy, huh? She said casually as she surveyed my apartment while I stared at her in disbelief. Then she motioned for me to take a seat in the armchair across from her. In dumbfounded silence, I just did what she said. She's surprisingly good at getting others to follow her commands. That small figure just seemed to command authority when she wanted it to. Well, I did promise you I'd explain everything, and I'm finally here to uphold that promise. After I explain, I've got a favor to ask, she said. I just stared at her in response for a long moment before finally just sputtering and stuttering. Okay. Lita laughed. Always so good with your words, huh, Jack? She teased. That's my name, by the way. Lita continued on to first tell me that her name wasn't actually Lita. Navia is her name. So Lita now, Navia, continued on to explain what had happened in the forest that night, and just who she really was. According to Navia, she comes from a long line of monster hunters. What we encountered in the forest five years ago was a parasitic species that can take over organic creatures that are controlled by one hive mind which, in this case, had taken the form of that coyote. They come from another world and showed up on Earth about 200 years ago. They're a species that tries to colonize worlds and consume whatever they can get in contact with, but Navia's group has been able to keep them at bay. They've taken the calling the species Webbers, since they trap their victims in that spider web-like substance, and the parasite looks somewhat like a spider when removed from its host. And yes, Navia and I agreed the name wasn't the best, but it's what stuck. The Webber is a much larger creature that separates itself into smaller creatures, which will then take over a host. They believe there are multiple Webbers from whatever world it is that they come from, but they don't know how many. They also don't actually know how the Webbers got here. Thus far, there are about five Webbers who had attempted to invade Earth, and only one of them had made repeat attempts. There have been 15 invasion attempts in the past 200 years. Whether that means they killed the other Webbers when they stopped them, they don't know. They just know this one particular Weber, they had taken the calling Ba, for Big Asshole Weber, is the one who keeps coming back. Navia says that her people need to start coming up with better names. The Webbers will take one primary host body on Earth, and then extend their control outwards into other creatures by trapping them and feeding them its black blood, so that its body becomes suitable for habitation. Then they will eventually turn into the warped creatures I saw five years ago. I angrily asked Navia why she didn't warn me or Hank about Abigail then, and she just sadly stated that she couldn't alert the Weber that she was on to its game. 
She thought maybe there was still time to save Abigail, since there have been cases where people in the process of becoming hosts have been able to be saved. She regretted what happened to Hank and that she couldn't save him. She explained that night was a train wreck and that she was supposed to have reinforcements come much earlier, but due to circumstances, they hadn't been able to arrive on time. Navi explained how her mother had been killed by the same Weber that she fought that night. Then she proceeded to nonchalantly drop that she was able to fight Ba so efficiently because she wasn't human. No. In fact, she's half-demon. She had to use a spell that suppressed her demonic abilities while she worked at the state park, so Ba wouldn't detect her, and the effects of the spell had finally worn off when we were trapped in the cave system. She only laughed at my dumbstruck expression, shrugged, and said that her mom had a weird and kind of shitty taste since her dad had never really been around anyways. She had been raised mostly by her grandpa, who was in fact Briggs. Surprise, surprise. That's not his real name either. So the man, who was really named Brisjan, left weeks earlier to get enough reinforcements to come back and deal with Ba when the signs had started showing up with another invasion was coming. But as you already know, he didn't get back until everything had already gone to shit. If I ever see him again, he and I are going to have some things to talk about. Navi explained to me that not only are there Webbers, demons, and magic, apparently there are a good many of things that are real, like vampires, werewolves, angels, fae, and dragons, among many other things. I really need to ask her about that later. She sped over the whole point as she explained that her organization were people who kept the peace and stopped the bad guys who threatened the balance, as she calls it. Can't say their name, unfortunately. Top secret and all that. She tells me that her group in the organization is looking for new members. They need reinforcements, since it's looking that the state park I had noticed may be the sign of a new invasion. Well... I'll cut to the chase. I said yes. I've got an opportunity to do something against those bastards and do some good. So, I'm going to take it. Navi is standing behind me now while I write this. She's very amused by how I described her. She also told me to stop treating her like a kid since she's over a hundred years old. That leaves me with a lot more questions I need to ask her later but I've got a lot I'm still trying to process. So, one step at a time there. Agreeing to join this organization means that I'm leaving everything behind now. I don't like the idea of leaving my girlfriend behind, but I know she wouldn't understand all of this or why I need to help Navia and her people. After I finish writing this, I'll be packing my things and making what preparations I need before I set out with Navia. My parting words to all of you are to be vigilant. There are many strange things in this world that we could write off as nothing but fantasy. But what many of us forget is that there are many things we don't know about this world. Better to keep a watchful eye than to be caught off guard if you do encounter something hidden from the majority of the world. And with that, I thank you all for reading and listening to this story, and I hope that you heed its warning. What happens in that park to the people like Hank and Abigail was a tragedy. Hopefully I could do something to now save people like them. Best regards and signing off. Jack. Perhaps I'll be making another report here one day to warn you all of more of those strange things that exist in this world so often unseen by the masses. Okay, what the heck is that shrieking sound? My girlfriend was only mildly frustrated from the background noise. I looked at her with a concerned look, as there was not much that I could do to stop the frightful wailing coming from the backyard. Sorry, my love, I told her through the phone, 
glancing up to my bedroom window across the room. It's the neighbor's dog. There must be a rabbit or something in the yard. I'm sure it's nothing. Well, it's kind of annoying me. All I could hear is that static shrieking through the phone. It's driving me crazy. Now forgive me if I make it sound like my girlfriend in any way dislikes dogs. That is not the case. She absolutely adores all animals, especially dogs. My neighbor's pet was simply growling in such a feral way that it could hardly be called a dog's bark. It sounded more akin to a wild animal fighting tooth and nails to save its life. The first night that I heard the howling outside my bedroom window, I was originally assuming that it was a wild coyote that had gotten hold of the neighbor's pet. However, the sounds did not cease as they should have. Hours have passed further into the night, and the dog continued to wail. This continued every night for nearly a week. The timing in which the animal would begin its horrendous screaming was not consistent, nor was the duration in which said screaming had lasted. I had contemplated speaking to the neighbor's son about their pet dog, but, due to my poor social skills, I had decided against it. Maybe I'll talk to my dad or one of the neighbors about it tomorrow morning and try to get some answers, I thought out loud. You should, because I don't want to hear it every night we call. She stated with such a tone in her voice that I got an impression the whole situation was my fault. Whether or not she intended to make me feel that way, she would never tell me. However, it was likely that she was not impressed with me ignoring the barking as a whole, rather than simply speaking with the neighbors about the animal's noise. The next morning, over an unhealthy breakfast of pancakes drowned in maple syrup, I had asked my father if he had heard the barking through the recent events. He confirmed that he had indeed heard the noise, and he had planned on asking the neighbors to keep their pets inside through the nights. It was clear to me that he had not slept as well as he had in the nights before. My father's eyes were sunken slightly, and barely visible dark circles had formed around them. His face seemed longer and more susceptible to frowning than his normal cheery look, and it was likely due to the fact that his eyes were so tired looking. That dang dog, he muttered before finishing his coffee and placing his mug into the sink. My father worked long days as a factory manager. He often had spent his spare time in the building itself to ensure the success of his employees, and more importantly, the future of his job. He had left that morning around 8 and likely wouldn't be home until 8 or so shortly after that night. His sleep schedule through the nights, where the dog's screeching was more apparent, was nearly non-existent. He had tasked me with the house chores through the days while he was away. One such chore was to visit the neighbor and, yes you guessed it, politely ask for them to keep their pets inside, or at the very least keep them quiet through the night as he was unsure when he would be able to ask in person. I bid him farewell on his day, and finished all the other household chores I had been tasked with for the day before noon hour. After baking some homemade sweets and preparing dinner, I had thrown together a dessert package for the neighbors, hoping that this would lessen the blow of my complaint. I rehearsed what I had prepared to say while I walked down the driveway to the five-minute dirt road to my neighbor's residence. The Whitmers were always kind people, from when I had remembered them. Mrs. Whitmer had passed away, too young as my father would say. Much like my mother, Mrs. Whitmer had left to go for a morning jog and had disappeared not five minutes from her own home. The difference between the two was that her body was found near the edge of a dense forest by authorities nearly four days later, and less than a half a mile from her own front door. The official cause of death was a bear attack, as the body was so horribly mangled and torn apart. Those five and a half long years without his wife had mentally destroyed Mr. Whitmer. He had become a hollow, cranky old shell of a former man he was. Mr. and Mrs. Whitmer had always loved to be outside with their vast array of pets, but in the years following Mrs. Whitmer's death, Mr. Whitmer was very rarely seen outside. 
The one memory that stuck with me about Mrs. Whitmer was the one of her telling me various tales of her husband's sweet tooth as she baked me cookies in the evening that my father had led the search party for my mother on the day that she went missing. She had passed away a year after my mother nearly to the day. I knocked on Mr. Whitmer's door, slightly praying that the tray of sweets at the very least would be enough to brighten his mood. After nearly two minutes, I had reached my hand out to knock again, but jumped back when I heard the lock violently turn and the door was pulled open. Hmm, what's this? He asked with a clear expression of confusion on his face. The old man was considerably more frail than the last time I had seen him, his face riddled with wrinkles, his hair thin and gray. He was slouching towards the open door with his arm holding the door open in such a manner that it appeared that he was using the door to hold himself up. I was afraid he would fall over at any moment. Uh, hi. Hello, uh, Mr. Whitmer. I stuttered out while trying desperately to remember the speech I had planned out. I was doing some baking for my dad and, uh, thought you might want a tray of some homemade sweets and stuff. I awkwardly smiled while holding the tray out for him to take. A warm smile slowly crossed his face as he held up one hand to decline my offer. No, no, it's quite thoughtful, son, but I haven't been able to eat anything like that in years. My sugar's too high, see? He explained. Oh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Whitmer. I didn't realize. I stammered feeling my own embarrassment becoming clear on my face. But before I could say anything else, Mr. Whitmer gazed out his front door and towards my house. Your new pup must be driving your father bonkers. He's awfully loud, ain't he? Huh? Uh oh we don't have a new pup, Mr. Whitmer. I felt chills run down my spine. The gravity of the situation hadn't fully sunken in yet, but it was startling nonetheless. That's why I came. I thought that maybe, maybe it was your dog. I trailed off. He slowly adjusted his gaze to me. I think in that moment, both the old man and I realized the same thing. I apologized to my neighbor for interrupting his day, to which he dismissed and welcomed me over any time. Before you go, he started as I had half turned away from his front door. You best stay inside after dark. Don't let your paw out if you can't help it, son. His face was pale, filled with fear, though he had obviously been trying to hide it. Clearly, this man had known more than he was willing to let on. I nodded and began towards my house. That evening was not unlike most evenings for me. I made and ate my dinner alone, prepared a plate for my father's late return, and hand-washed the dishes that I had dirtied. I then made myself comfortable on the living room couch, after popping in an old shark movie from the 70s in the DVD player. I wanted to be close to the front door to greet my father upon his return, hence why I chose to reside temporarily within the closest room to the front entrance, the living room. After a particular scene where the antagonist shark of the film jump-scared an old fishing boat, my father had unlocked the front door loudly. The creaky metal lock snapped open lined up nearly perfectly with the jump scare that I nearly fell off the couch, due to the startling sound my father made. My father entered the house, closing the door behind him as I regained my composure. I must have done a poor job of hiding my temporary fright as he asked me if I was alright as soon as he saw me. I then explained the scare that he gave me, to which we had a laugh together. He then took off his shoes, warmed his dinner, and joined me for the film's final. Having seen the movie so often, my father had quoted nearly every memorable line left in the film, and we remarked on the film's greatness as the credits began to roll. My father had began to feast while I searched through our old films for another classic to play. 
I looked back to my father as soon as I heard the faint squealing sounds coming from outside. He sat a few feet behind me in his lazy boy armchair, chewing slow and quietly as he listened. Mr. Whitmer, I started, but my father only nodded as he finished chewing and finished my sentence for me. He doesn't have a dog. I dropped by his place on my way home. I waited. I waited for my father to continue. I waited for my father to express how proud he was of me for making our neighbor sweets. I waited for my father to change the topic. I waited for my father to express his theories as to which he believed the barking to be. Finally, he spoke. I don't want you going outside for a while. Not if you could help it. I'm going to take some time off and we're going to take a vacation soon. I looked to him with concern. He was raising more questions than he was answering, and I knew that if I was to pray then he would only become stressed. My father rarely stresses, but when he does, he typically would not calm down for a few hours. I would not want him to lose any extra sleep over stress, as he was only getting a bare minimum amount of sleep anyways. My father and I indulged in my homemade sweets while trying to ignore the screaming animal outside. I had prayed that the sounds would eventually fade into background noise, but I could never get used to the wailing no matter how hard I tried. My father had ended up going up to bed shortly after 10 o'clock that evening. I had decided to text my girlfriend while I finished watching an 80s science fiction robot movie to try to distract myself from the blood-curdling howling coming from the backyard. I did not want to tell my girlfriend about how the screeching had not stopped since our last phone call, due to the lack of answers I possessed as to what was creating the screeching. I was concerned that she would grow to worry for me. Ever figure out why your neighbor's dog keeps barking every night? Beside her text was a little yellow ponder emoji. You know, the one with the little index finger and the thumb stroking the chin of the circular head? That's the one. No, not yet. It's probably just some wild animal scaring it. Or maybe it's the mating call of a fox or a coyote. I messaged her back and used the same thinking emoji that she had sent me. Now feeling stressed about the mysterious and ever so consistent animal howling outside, I decided that I would partake in eating some potato chips to cure my anxious thoughts. I may have developed a bad habit of stress eating junk food the night my mother went missing. Now I am by no means obese, I am quite thin and I rarely eat such foods to begin with. However, when I do, I eat a lot at once. I stood up off the couch and paused the film with the television remote. With the soundtrack of the movie now on pause, it was at this point that I had suddenly realized that terror sounds from outside were no longer present. In fact, nearly every sound was gone. It was so quiet that I was positive that I could hear the blood rushing from my ears. I heard my heart racing, throbbing in my chest. My slow and shallow breaths came out like blaring bomb sirens when compared to the stillness in that moment. I think it stopped. I text my girlfriend after a long moment of standing still. I took one step towards the kitchen and froze when I heard a loud crashing sound coming from the basement. I jumped as I heard what sounded like several glass pans smashing to millions of pieces on the downstairs floor. My father had likely heard the loud crash too, as he was out of his room and down the stairway leading to the second floor in a matter of seconds his double-barrel shotgun held firmly in hand. His knuckles were white as he clutched the gun and, with a satisfying click, he opened the gun and popped two ammunition shells into the barrel and popped the shotgun closed. I stood motionless, frozen, staring deep into my father's eyes. I was searching for comfort, for anything that would calm me down, anything to tell me that we would be okay and safe. I never found what I was looking for. What the hell was that? 
my father whispered under his breath as he stared behind me towards the basement door. He kept his eyes trained on that door and never once took his eyes off of it. He kept his ears alert and listened for any further sounds, and he kept his shotgun loaded and firmly in his grasp. I didn't reply to him. I simply stood still. After another minute or two of us locked in the situation, tied like puppets by the strings of fear, my father slowly loosened his grip on the gun and brought it down to his side in one hand. Must just be a squirrel or... Just as quickly as my father had started speaking, he was cut off by the horrible wailing again. The wailing was much louder now. The sound was not coming from outside. This time, the sound was coming from the basement, right below us. The window pans on the front door began to rattle, and the pictures were violently shaken off the walls. I dropped my phone and brought up my hands to cover my ears. I clenched my teeth and shut my eyes, but no matter how hard I tried, I was unable to prevent the sounds from reaching my ears. My palms grew sweaty and wet. No, not sweat. It was blood. My ears bled and rang. My head pounded. My vision blurred. The whole world began to rapidly spin around me. At some point, my father had grabbed my arm and led me outside in a panic. He led me directly to the deep blue pickup truck that he drove and I climbed into the passenger seat while he went around to the driver's side and pulled himself inside. He gently tossed the shotgun to the back seat and gripped the steering wheel. After a moment of us both catching our breaths, he looked to me and analyzed my wounds. He too had a small trickle of blood coming from his ears. Are you hurt? He asked me breathlessly. No, I'm fine. I stammered out. Wh what was that thing? I asked. Well, I sure could tell you it ain't no bear. He started while he looked around for his keys. After a long moment, and his single deep inhale followed by him blowing out all of his air from his lungs aggressively through his mouth, he stated, They're inside, as calmly as he could. I knew what he meant. We were trapped until one of us had decided to leave the temporary safety of the vehicle and head into the monster's new lair to retrieve our salvation. I'm faster than you are, I began. No, he said calmly, yet firmly. I can fire the gun, you've shown me before. I said no, my father yelled, his emotions taking control over him. I've lost your mother to that thing, and I ain't losing you to it. It was apparent that he had instinctively regretted saying what he had just said, as he was likely trying to hide this from me for some time. I wondered if Mr. Whitmer had known about this creature as well. I waited a long while before I asked what had been on my mind. Lost mom to what, dad? He was silently sobbing for what felt like an eternity before he wiped his eyes and looked over at me. The night that we lost her, he began slowly, seemingly second-guessing on whether or not he should tell me. I led that search party through the woods, and eventually the sun began to set. We were going to pack it in for the night and look again come morning. However, there was a shriek, a small whimper, a cry of some sort, off in the distance. So a few of us go, flashlights drawn, and we take a look. Well, we turned from a few trees and we got to where it came from, but there ain't nothing there. We looked around and around, but still nothing. Then, one of the guys gets the bright idea to look up. I tell you, son, I prayed more in those five minutes than I ever have in my whole life. He paused for about a minute, his gaze fixed to the front door of the house, still wide open with the living room's orange lights spilling just outside the front door. The wailing had stopped again, which to me was not any more relief than if it had kept going. 
He stroked his scruffy chin before continuing. Up in that tree, there was something big. It looked to be like some really muscular badger or maybe a wolverine or some sort of dog. But the thing that glowed from the flashlight's beam was your mother's favorite necklace. It was just there, dangling outside of its mouth. The thing was staring at us with its lifeless eyes, just pure black eyes. It let out its cry, the same way we've been hearing, just a single yelp and it hopped off through the trees. That one was the baby, cause something real big, much bigger than it, was following. We ran like hell out of there. We never found that thing again. We went looking the next day. Didn't even find the necklace. If my father had told me this tale any other night, I would have thought that he was drunk the night he went searching for my mother all those years ago. However, given the current situation, I believed him. Of course the police didn't believe us. They thought that we had encountered a raccoon in the trees or something else small, I suppose. As I gawked at my father, something caught my eye. Right outside his driver's side window were two small yellow circles simply hovering. I shifted my gaze and peered out his window as he kept talking. I didn't pick up on what he was saying. I only focused on the figure outside his window. I realized too late that the yellow orbs were actually the moon's reflection on the shiny black eyes of this creature. The bean smashed its head through the window with ease, its massive hulking canine-like head over my father's lap and in front of his face. Both my father and I jumped from terror. The creature began violently shaking its massive head back and forth, opening and closing its maw. Its teeth were a deep yellow and looked more like shark's teeth. They were thick, triangular, and serrated, and the beast had countless rows of these teeth in its snout. Its fur was thick, jet black with matted patches of red. Blood formed around the top and bottom of the creature's head, from where it had cut itself on the broken glass, yet it seemed to be in no pain as it continued to shake its fierce head snarling and biting the air. Its eyes looked fake. They were bulging orbs of shiny blackness, almost like that of a stuffed teddy bear's eyes. Between my screaming and my father kicking and pounding on the beast's head, he yelled for me to fire the shotgun into the creature's face. I spun around and tried to reach for the gun in the back seat. My fingertips managed to graze the gun's handle as a wet, warm splash of liquid drenched over my face, accompanied by a sickening, wet, squishy sound. My father screamed, and I wiped my eyes and spat out the copper-tasting fluid. With an extremely deep crunching, more of my father's pain hollering and the blood flying everywhere, the beast had pulled my father out the truck door window by his left arm and off into the night. Within seconds, I was alone, shaking in shock and in silence. I sobbed before slowly turning around and again reaching for the shotgun. I had not entirely processed what had just happened in those short few minutes as, when I retrieved the firearm, I aimed it out the window that the monster had dragged my father out of and whimpered about how I didn't want to shoot my dad and how the beast was moving too much to get a good shot. A series of quiet and fast knocking on my window jolted me back into reality. As I spun around, not sure of what to expect, Mr. Whitmer stood outside my door, face full of confusion. Sonny, are you alright? Where's your pa? He asked in his tired voice. I only screamed something about a dire wolf going rogue, which, of course, had confused him even more so. Through my panic attempts to warn the old man, he had eventually understood the important part of the message, and turned to go back towards his house. The poor old man hadn't made it three feet from my window before the canine creature had appeared seemingly out of nowhere, and proceeded to maul the man. He didn't even scream while the attack happened, 
either because the attack startled him so badly that his heart gave out, or because the animal had attacked his head and neck area to begin with, and had killed him instantly. It viciously tore at the man and shook him around as his corpse was a new chewing toy for the oversized dog. An arm had flown off and cracked my window before leaving a thick streak of blood from the large crack towards the ground. I nearly threw up when I saw the cryptid holding the body in its mouth. Then it stood on its hind legs, placing its front paws on the torso of the old man's body and separated the body in half from its waist. I closed my eyes and listened to the horrible sound of the man being reduced to ribbons only a few feet away from me. The sound of police sirens and the multicolored flashing lights had began enough to persuade the creature into hiding. I watched as it growled its deep growl and turned a full 180 degrees and sprinted into the dense forest behind my house. I sat there and sobbed, waiting for the officers to collect me. By the time a kind ambulance driver and young police officer had arrived at the truck door, I was dry heaving and on the verge of hyperventilating. There was no physical trauma done to me, so I sat in the back of the ambulance with one of the younger officers and a blanket wrapped around me. She explained to me that there was a call from the neighbor's house, as the man who had placed the call was worried from all the commotion outside. God bless you, Mr. Whitmore, I thought to myself. I then explained to the young woman how the dog-like creature had used its screaming to try and deafen my father and I, about how the animal had broken into the house and about how it dragged my father away, and lastly about the death of Mr. Whitmore. The remains of Mr. Whitmore had only been several long strips of flesh, and clothes in a small puddle of blood with the odd bone fragment. His whole right arm was later recovered just under my father's pickup truck on the passenger side, while other officers drew their weapons and examined the surrounding area. I kept insisting to the woman that it was a dog that lived in the trees with rows and rows of teeth, with a horrible scream with its lifeless coal-black eyes. They recorded the entire incident as a bear attack, of course, and dismissed my story as shock-induced trauma. They found my father, still breathing however unconscious, in the backyard, near the tree line. His whole left arm from about the shoulder down was severely shredded. He and I were rushed to the hospital in the ambulance, and he underwent immediate surgery on his arm. They could only do as much in terms of nerve repair. However, he was able to keep his arm. He would go through several long months of therapy to regain nearly complete control over his arm and all his fingers. He cannot extend any finger in full length, nor can he touch the palm of his hand with his fingertips. However, he has gotten used to using his hand quite well. He is still considerably weaker in that arm than in the other, though he was always more dominant in his right arm anyways. As for me, I have received extensive therapy for my daily nightmares. I've had the odd case of that creature returning to me in a state of sleep paralysis, which is a horror story on its own. The truly haunting part is that I haven't heard a single sound since the last attack a year ago. The haunting part is knowing that this creature is out there and still alive. The haunting part is finding out that these creatures go into hiding for about 50 weeks or so out of the year and then they come out for two. The haunting part is hearing the screaming coming from the forest last night accompanied by another, much louder screaming. A much closer screaming. My eyes bursted open, flooding my vision with sunlight. I'm usually not a morning person, but the excitement accompanying our planned trip had me bursting to jump out of bed, ready to get going as soon as the sun crept into our bedroom. Babe, wake up. Let's get a jump on traffic and get going now, I said as I nudged my sleeping fiancé Demi awake. 
She grunted her disapproval and muttered something about having set an alarm. But I was determined to get going so we could be at the airport waiting for our scheduled flight without the worry of running late and potentially missing our flight. I sat up in bed, pulling the covers off my sleeping bride-to-be. Annoyed, she rolled over and dragged herself to the edge of the bed, casting a death glare at me over her shoulder. I smiled at her and marveled at her beauty. Corny, I know, but it's true. The sun cast a glow around her and I was completely memorized. Nearly a decade together, and the feeling of awe and amazement was as present as it was the very first time dating. I looked at her, and the feeling of love and adoration washed over me. She left the bed and made her way to the bathroom, and I sat gazing into space, absent-minded. You rushed me out of bed, now you're sitting and daydreaming? She laughed. I snapped out of my daze and laughed with her. I guess you're right. I acknowledged. Her dark hair glistened in the sun, made all the darker by her pale skin. It was a particularly beautiful combination of dark hair and light skin, not the goth emo kind of look you see depicted in movies. Her soul-catching eyes made that much more captivating as they twinkled in the golden rays looking down on us. I followed her into the bathroom to brush my teeth and get the day started. I could feel Demi's excitement growing as we stood together side by side, the cool smell of mint from the toothpaste engulfing us. She didn't say anything, but I could see her infectious smile building up as she brushed. Neither of us had ever been to any part of North America, and we jumped at the opportunity to take the trip. Our good friend Joseph had set out the wedding invites months back, and we decided to take the trip to celebrate his beautiful union, while at the same time making the most of the trip and going a couple of weeks before the wedding date to see all that we could see. When we told Joseph that we would be there a few weeks before the wedding just to have a little bit of a vacation, he immediately offered us a room at his place. I'm not sure who was the most excited out of all of us, but here we were, bags packed, getting ready to take a trip across the ocean. It was an exciting prospect, giving us a chance to see another country. Demi and I had taken a few trips around Europe while we got our respective degrees. But the allure of America had always bit at Demi, and now we had the opportunity to go and take another country off the list. We spat out the toothpaste in tandem and rinsed our mouths clean. We walked back to the bedroom while Demi began her morning routine of applying dozens of skincare products to her face. Maybe she's a vampire, I thought to myself with a chuckle. And that's why she's so pale and always needs to put on products on her face. It's to protect her from the sun, my overactive imagination continued. What are you laughing at? Demi shot back at me from the bathroom. Not much, just thinking to myself. I replied to her. Thinking, huh? Well, that's a first, she retorted with a laugh. I laughed quietly at her witty reply while I opened the wardrobe and selected the best option that I could think of for traveling. Gray sweatpants, a black shirt, and a gray sweater. Somewhat stylish and extremely comfortable. In my opinion, it is extremely important to be comfortable on long trips. I never understood how people could wear suits and other such formal wear when they are traveling long distances. But different strokes for different folks. Demi soon joined me in the bedroom, donning the same travel wear as me. We always made it a habit to dress the same when we would travel. It was just a fun thing we did. Matching outfits on, we were ready to set off to the airport. I began loading the car with our suitcases and travel bags, while Demi ensured our documents were in order so that we could get through the airport easier. Boarding passes downloaded on our phones, passports secured, cash for emergencies tucked away safely in our hidden compartment within the bag. Once the final checks for anything left behind was completed, we triple checked that the door was locked and bundled into the car. The plush leather was cold, as you would expect in winter, and the steering wheel seemed to bite my hand as I gripped it to navigate the road. 
Almost as if reading my mind, Demi pressed the button for the heated seats to activate, and I soon found myself suitably warm and quite cozy. I'm surprised I didn't doze off. I felt like I had snuggled back into bed. It was about a 30-minute car ride to the airport, of which most of the time we spent belting out Black Bear songs at the top of our voices. We weren't the best singers, but in the privacy of your own vehicle, fun trumps ability when it comes to entertainment. It wasn't long until we arrived at the airport and made our way to the long-stay parking lot. We found our parking and slotted our car neatly into the endless rows of cars waiting for their owners to return. Bags in tow, holding hands and full of smiles, we entered the airport more than ready for our trip and adventure. The airport itself was a hub of activity. People swarmed in from every direction, some running so not to miss their flights. That wouldn't be us. We were here well ahead of time. We took a leisurely walk around the area that housed the restaurants and other eateries, deciding to have a nice sit-down meal before our flight. The boarding gate had not opened, so we had to kill time. There would be nothing better than getting something to eat. Settling in at Weatherspoons, I couldn't help but feel a yearning for McDonald's. For some reason, if I see a McDonald's, I want it. Looking at the menu and seeing barbecue ribs quickly snapped me out of my McDonald's fixation, and I eagerly waited to give my order. Isn't 7 a.m. rather early for ribs? Demi asked me. She had ordered Eggs Benedict, as she often did when we went out for breakfast. Her surprise at the ribs turned to shock when I ordered a pint of beer to accompany the ribs. What? I asked her with a smile. We're on holiday now. Time to let loose a little. We sat at our table and looked around at the other travelers. Demi and I always played this game where we imagined where people were going and why. We sat talking about people and laughing, even when our food had arrived. The ribs looked sublime. They were falling off the bone and absolutely drenched in sauce, while Demi's plate looked more in line with something you would see on a cooking TV show. I could tell she regretted her decision somewhat, and as any loving fiancé would, I gave her one of my ribs to try. You always order food that tastes better than mine, she complained jokingly. I think I should just let you order for me from now on, she continued. I laughed and agreed, while wiping a bit of barbecue sauce off her chin, a sure sign that she was enjoying her meal. We ate slowly enjoying each other's company and talking about what we were going to do once we had arrived. Before we knew it, the intercom was sounding and alerting us that the boarding gates were now open. Finishing off the last of my beer, we settled the bill, grabbing our bags and made our way to check in. The gate was crowded as, the gate was, crowded as was to be expected, but with the rack of ribs and beer in my belly, I wasn't too fussed with the slow-moving line. We slowly made our way to the front of the line, scanned our passports, and walked on to the airplane. We found our seats, stowed our overhead bags, and settled in. Demi unpacked her iPad and headphones as she prepared for the 4,000-mile journey. As for me, one of my greatest attributes is to being able to sleep almost on command. So my plan for the flight was to kick back, sleep, and wake up when we got to Michigan. The airplane wasn't anything spectacular your usual three-row seats on either side with a row down the middle, a small screen to watch whatever movies they decided were best for entertainment. Demi could never sleep on flights, so she would download as many movies and episodes of series as she could so that she wouldn't be bored while I slept. Often we would watch each other, but odds are I would fall asleep before we even watched one movie. No sooner that when we had taken off that I felt my eyes getting heavy with sleep, I welcomed the darkness with open arms. Sleeping is amazing. It's like a time machine to the future when you're traveling. You sleep and all of a sudden, you're at your destination. I was jolted awake after what felt like a few minutes of shut-eye. I stared around in shock, confused as to what was happening. 
Demi laughed as she told me that the pilot had said they were descending and to prepare for slight turbulence as we dropped towards the ground. My pounding heart slowed down slightly as I looked at the completely calm passengers around me. The fear turned to excitement as the realization that we were nearly touching down came to me. We were about to land. Demi gripped my hand as we approached the ground. I couldn't tell if she was somewhat nervous or the excitement had gotten to her too. Once we landed, the plane disembarked relatively quickly and we were once again in a line to get our passports stamped. That too didn't take long and we hastily made our way through duty-free towards arrivals. Once we got through, the figure of Joseph was waiting for us with the biggest smile on his face. It had been years since we had last seen him, and the joy was contagious. I immediately bursted into a grin and quickened my pace to meet the smiling man. I had met Joseph in preschool, and throughout our years in education, we were in the same school right up until the end. We parted ways to go to the university, as we envisioned different paths in life regarding our career choices. Even living thousands of miles away from each other for so long, we chatted frequently and checked in with one another. It was a friendship that had stood the test of time. With my quickened pace, Joseph was very soon right in front of me. We didn't even say anything. We simply laughed and embraced. Demi approached us and we disengaged the embrace so Joseph could greet her. He took a step back and looked at us with a gleam in his eye. Oh man, I can't believe you guys are really here, he exclaimed to us. I had hoped you two would come for the wedding, but coming this far before is a real treat. It's been so long since I've seen you guys. We wouldn't have missed your wedding for the world, I told Joseph with a smile. And what could be better than coming and spending a bit of time seeing where you have decided to set up shop? I asked him. Let's get going. I can't wait for you guys to meet Elizabeth. Joseph's hulking figure lurked towards us and retrieved Demi's bag. You're a big man, Alex. You could pull your own bag, he said with a laugh. His dark hair and dark skin turned in a flash, and in the blink of an eye, he was a good distance ahead of us. I'm by no means a small person. I stand at a humble height of around 5'8". But what I lack for in height, I make up for in stature. Having weight trained religiously for almost my entire life, I have a pretty good decent amount of muscle on me. With age, I've turned the intensity down a bit and become a little bit softer in certain areas. Joseph, in comparison, was over six foot. He never explicitly said outright how tall he is, but pretty tall is the answer. He was never one for the gym, and his tall frame had always been filled out by a pretty solid physique brought about by sports and eating takeaways. If I had to describe him in one word, it would be burly. We were soon out of the airport and heading towards a pretty big truck. Right off the bat, the stereotypical image on American living popped into my head. A burly man in a flannel shirt driving a huge truck. Once again, I found myself chuckling to myself. You're really enjoying talking to yourself, huh? Demi said, smiling. The best company you can keep is yourself, I replied with a smirk. Once we were at Joseph's truck, he gently lifted the bags into the back and closed the cover over them. Jump in, guys. We got a bit of a drive ahead of us, he warned. Living deep in the woods, are you? Demi asked playfully. I didn't expect the stone-cold reply of, yeah, kind of, but I like the peace and quiet. As we drove through the bustle of the town, I couldn't help but wonder about where we were going. I'm not the biggest fan of city life, and so I was quite excited that we would be staying away from the bright lights. We took the time we had during the drive, about an hour or so, according to Joseph, to find out more about Elizabeth. Demi and I obviously chatted with her on Skype and FaceTime when we had called Joseph, but we wanted to know the small things about her so we could really get to know the woman who was marrying my oldest friend. The conversation flowed, and I barely noticed the transition from the city lights to the trees covering us from both sides. 
nearly home, Joseph said excitingly. Less than a hundred meters later, we turned off the main road onto a dirt road. I thought he would have lived kind of in the woods, but I definitely wasn't expecting a literal cabin in the woods. As we drove down the dirt path, we approached his house. It was a pretty humble, old-style farmhouse kind of home. There were absolutely no neighbors around. That shocked me almost as much as how much woodland surrounded us. Yo, why haven't you got any neighbors? I asked Joseph. You're just used to living like sardines, aren't you? Joseph replied jokingly. This made Demi and I burst out laughing. Residing in England, most houses are semi-attached. So it's almost like one house split right down the middle, and then shared as two houses. So I guess he had a point. We don't live like that out here. Here, you have so much space as your garden, it's incredible. All the forest is virtually untouched. Our nearest neighbor is miles away. And Joseph, being Joseph, had finished the statement with a creepy line from a horror movie. Out here, no one will hear you scream, he laughed. We pulled up his driveway into the side of the house. Elizabeth was standing at the door waiting for us, the lights in the house shining brighter than the stars above us. Home sweet home. Joseph told us as he threw the gear knob into park. With the visible excitement of a child at Christmas time, he jumped out of the car and ran the few steps to his future wife. Babe, babe, they're here, look! He shouted with glee. He quickly returned to the truck and hauled the bags towards the house, encouraging us to go inside and settle in. It's so nice to finally meet you, Elizabeth said with just as much excitement as Joseph. They had the same energy. They were a perfect match. We've talked so much, but meeting in person is just the best, she continued. I couldn't agree more. I replied to her with a friendly smile. We exchanged pleasantries and gave her a tentative hug after traveling for so long. You guys must be exhausted. Why not freshen up before dinner so you could relax, she asked us. That sounds absolutely delightful, Demi said with a smile. We walked through the living room, guided by Joseph. The living room was pretty eerie, with the heads of more than a few animals decorating the walls. Become quite the hunter, I see, I inquired. Yes, sir. Nothing like going into the woods and bagging a prize. I'll take you guys if you're up for it. I know you guys love the outdoors. That would be great. We'd love to. Demi and I said in unison. I mean, if you guys are up for it, Elizabeth's brother was actually pitching a tent not too far from here. If you guys are feeling jet-lagged and don't want to sleep yet, we could take a walk and sit by the fire. Walking in the quiet of the night is a beautiful experience, Joseph continued. Having slept for the whole flight, I didn't feel at all tired, and so the offer actually sounded pretty good to me. I figured a walk would make me a little tired, and the fresh air would definitely relax me. I'm keen, I replied in a heartbeat. Hmm, I'm a bit tired, but if it's not too far, I'd be happy to come too, Demi said. Great, let's eat and get going. No point in showering now. You'll want to shower once you get back, rather, Joseph told us. I didn't realize just how hungry I was. I had two full plate servings of beef stew and potatoes. It was very tasty and an extremely different flavor from the usual cooking in England. We washed the stew down with a logical brewed beer that Joseph said paired extremely well with the meat. I have to agree with him as the beer tasted fantastic when we guzzled it by the pint while we ate. With the plates barely cleared, Joseph asked Elizabeth if she was coming. His question was met with a groan and complaints about not wanting to get dirty. After a bit of persuasion, Elizabeth finally gave in. Ever since we were kids, Joseph had an incredible knack for badgering people into saying yes, even after they had repeatedly said no to something. Joseph retrieved flashlights from a storage cupboard and handed one to each of us. It gets pretty dark out, he advised. There isn't much light pollution, so the only light is the good old moon. 
we set out, with Joseph leading the pack. The path wasn't quite wide enough for us to walk side by side, so we walked in a single line formation. I brought up the rear with my reasoning being I could protect my woman if we were attacked by a bear or something if I was behind her, seeing as Joseph and Elizabeth were ahead of us. The trees surrounded us seemed to almost suck the light directly out of our flashlights. Every time we would shine my light towards the trees, the light seemed to almost disappear just as soon as I had lifted the beam. I opted to keep my light trained on the ground ahead of me. Joseph called back some facts about Michigan and the surrounding woods every so often. I couldn't quite hear him, but I appreciated the sediment. We walked for about 20 minutes when I could see a flickering light not too far ahead of us. The silence startled me. Usually in the woods, you could hear branches snapping and the crickets and other nocturnal animals going about their lives. It was eerie, this silence. Almost as if the animals had opted not to come out and stayed in their burrows and trees. As we approached the light given off by a fairly large campfire, we saw the figure huddled over with their back turned to us. We were but a few feet from it and they didn't seem to have heard us. Hey Daniel, Joseph hollered, shattering the silence. The figure turned around slowly, revealing a stone-faced gentleman, roughly about our age if I had to guess. Why do you need the shout? I was enjoying the silence. The figure answered in an annoyed tone. Sorry about that, bud. I'm just super excited. Alex is here, Joseph said. That's nice at all, but there's really no need to be so loud. Daniel said as he stood up. He shook mine and Demi's hand very firmly and softly said something about having heard all about us. We thought we'd come out here for a bit and sit by the fire, show Alex and Demi the beauty of the woods at night, Joseph explained. Okay, have a seat, Daniel said gesturing towards the wooden stools posted around the inferno. We all sat side by side, no one spoke for a while. We just gazed into the fire, almost as if hypnotized. It was, of course, Joseph that broke the silence. All he did was comment on how beautiful the night was, and how you don't get to see the stars like this in the city. It seemed to set Daniel off, and he stood up and glared at Joseph. Why do you find it so hard to sit quietly? Are you a frickin' child? He hissed at Joseph. It was quite strange. Daniel couldn't have been much taller than me, with considerably less muscle or fat on him. Joseph would completely tower over him if he stood up. As Daniel stood up, his blonde hair bounced. His bluish-looking eyes seemed to flicker with a deep sense of rage. Joseph, however, didn't even flinch. He didn't even look at Daniel. All he said was, Relax, dude. We're just here to enjoy the fire. Don't be so rude in front of our guests, please. This seemed to infuriate Daniel more than a mouthful of verbal abuse, and he turned to walk away before we could open our mouths to say something. What surprised me was that he walked towards the thicket of trees and not towards the path from which we came. His tent was in the clearing near the fire, and I didn't see him carry a flashlight. Yo, what's that all about? I asked the nonchalant couple sitting with us. Daniel is interesting, Elizabeth replied. Interesting isn't quite the word I'd use. He's more of a runt with a C, Joseph corrected her. He practically lives in the forest and feels like it's super important to be respectful and honor the wild, Joseph continued. He doesn't like to be disturbed when he's out here doing his thing, Joseph added. I didn't see him carry a flashlight or anything, Demi asked, almost as if she read my mind. Joseph shrugged and replied, I don't know, he probably knows the terrain from memory and he uses the stars to navigate or something, who knows. I barely knew Daniel, but concern for his safety washed over me, especially as Joseph and Elizabeth didn't seem phased at all. Aren't there any animals out here that could hurt him down? I asked. We got black bears, but they aren't known for being aggressive. They're usually pretty shy, and they'll only really attack if they feel threatened, Joseph reassured me. 
Okay, so we're just going to chill here, or... Demi asked uncomfortably. No need for us to get in a huff about Daniel. He'll calm down and come back. Enjoy the wilderness and the fresh air, Elizabeth said with a seemingly forced smile. Once again, I got lost into the flames. It was as if my very soul was absorbed by the fire and I couldn't look away. It was almost meditative. I felt extremely relaxed but also mindful of my surroundings. A thought crossed my mind about how incredible it felt. And for a moment, I could almost relate to Daniel in that I didn't want anything to disturb me while I was entranced by the dancing flames. As my consciousness seemingly drifted into and became one with the forest itself, I once again came to realize there was no sounds around us. Just as I was about to ask if anyone else noticed it, I knew without a doubt we all heard it. The scream seemed to pierce my very soul. From the extreme relaxation of the fire, I felt a fear I had never felt before. The scream sounded like it came from a soul being tortured in the very depths of hell. In my 27 years on this earth, I had never heard a more gut-wrenched scream. I looked around me and everyone was frozen in fear. No one moved. Eyes shifted to look around, but not one muscle was moved. I could see Demi trembling and I was instinctively reaching out to comfort her. She recoiled at my touch and shrieked in fear. Her scream was nowhere near what we had just heard. Joseph and Elizabeth didn't even flinch at Demi's shriek. Was that... was that Daniel? I asked. No, no it wasn't. It couldn't have been. Joseph stammered. Having been broken out of the frozen fear trance, Joseph stumbled and tripped rushing to get to the tent. I was riddled with confusion, thinking he was hoping to see refuge in the flimsy tent. It was only when his top half emerged after rustling around in the tent that I saw the rifle he gripped with white knuckles. A branch snapped behind him and he turned with the speed I had never seen and aimed the rifle in the dark. He backed slowly towards us and we huddled into a circle of sorts with our backs towards each other, trying to peer into the dark. Should we go and look for Daniel? Demi asked fearfully. Did you hear that scream? It didn't sound like any sound a man could make. I've watched enough horror movies to know not to be a hero. We could run back to the house and call the police. Once we're safe in the house, we could plan better, Joseph suggested. Elizabeth hadn't said a word. She was as white as a ghost with eyes that looked as if they would burst from her head. She just whimpered and whispered Daniel's name. Let's go. We can't stand around here waiting for whatever that was, I said. Equipped with our flashlights and Joseph leading the way with the rifle, we moved swiftly back to the trail that would lead us home. The trees that seemed somewhat entertaining on the way there were now taunting us, hiding something that could potentially harm us. Wolves, maybe? And if it was a wolf, surely there would be more than one. I thought I heard something behind me, so I turned to look. The lapse in concentration was enough to distract me to the fact that the line in front of us had stopped, and so I ran into the huddled group. Why the hell did you all stop? I screamed at them. No one answered me as I collected myself and picked up my dropped flashlight. I lifted the flashlight and didn't understand what was going on at first. I couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. It was Elizabeth's scream that made me focus and understand it all. Lying in the middle of our path was intestines. I know exactly what they are because I had seen pigs being slaughtered in England. The blood covered the path ahead, and the internals were spread across the road in an almost playful display of malice. Joseph didn't say a word. He lunged over the intestines and shouted back at us to keep going. The blood seemed to sparkle in the light we shone it on. The dirt soaked up as much of the blood as it could but the sheer volume of the blood left there meant the ground pooled on top of the path. We snapped out of the shock 
and moved forward to Joseph's light, as I see he had stopped to wait for us. We caught up to him and realized that he didn't stop to wait to us. He stopped because his arms and legs had now blocked the path. They had clearly been ripped from the body, and the loose ligaments and tendons hung to the dismembered body parts. Joseph had resigned to hunch over and vomiting into the trees. Elizabeth collapsed into the dirt and covered her face. Demi stood, gazing at the horror before us. I walked over to her slowly, wanting to be next to her in case whatever did this was close to us. I looked down and saw the arms and legs had been partially shredded. The bone was exposed going towards the hands and feet. Yet more blood pooled all around. Immediately, I wondered how much blood the human body contained for such amounts to be spread all around. I helped Elizabeth up, and she immediately collapsed again after looking at the mess in front of us. That's Daniel's watch! She screamed, pointing to the timepiece covered in blood on one of the arms. What the hell did this to my brother? She sobbed. Joseph pulled her up and hobbled through the appendices. They didn't stumble five steps before we heard the scream again. Demi gripped my arms so tight I could feel her nails penetrating my skin. I felt my body tremble. Whatever had done this was close. It sounded like it was right next to us. I switched off my flashlight and fumbled to get Demi's to do the same. She stifled a yelp and asked me what I was doing. But before I could answer, we were stunned by the sound of the trees ahead crashing down. The sound of the trees breaking and deafening, almost as loud as the fear-inspiring scream. The sound of Elizabeth and Joseph screaming made me instinctively turn the flashlight on to see what had breached the trees. What stood before me was something straight out of a nightmare. My flashlight did nothing more than illuminate the bits of the beast that had literally torn Daniel to pieces and strewn him all over the path. The thought of his intestines and arms and legs ripped off made my blood run cold. I was brought back to reality at the sound of the rifle going off. Demi and I trained our flashlights on the beast and saw Joseph had taken a shot at it. I don't think it did much, as the beast barely flinched. It stood dwarfing Joseph. It must have been at least seven feet tall. Joseph just about reached half its height. The light we cast on it made the nightmare all the scarier. I got a glimpse of its red eyes, and they burned in the light like a coal. The blood soaking its muzzle dripped in spatters and hit the floor. I had no idea what it was. The best way to describe it is a huge, well-built wolf that stood erect. It was covered in thick-looking fur. As it snarled at my friend and his fiancé, I caught a glimpse of its teeth. It was as if a shark was crossed with a wolf from Red Riding Hood. I had no doubt that teeth like that were capable of making scraps of a body, as we saw with Daniel's body. I was frozen in fear and the events seemed to almost happen in slow motion. It swung one of its front legs and completely knocked Joseph off of his feet in a fair distance away. It was as if a truck had hit him. I moved my light to check on Joseph, and he wasn't moving. I immediately moved back to keep my eye on the beast, as it hadn't noticed Demi and I by some miracle. It looked down at Elizabeth, and it seemed like there was a glimmer of excitement in its eyes. Drool dripped down into the blood, mixing together and falling to the ground. I whispered to Demi that we had to make a run for it. If we stayed here, we'd die. At the very least, the beast would be somewhat distracted by Elizabeth, and hopefully we could make it some distance and get away from it. Worst case... I would turn back and try to hold it off while Demi tried to get to safety. We had nothing to lose by trying to get past. Gripping her hand tightly in mine, I sprinted forward, making sure to glance down occasionally to ensure we didn't trip over something and end our escape plan before we even had a chance. 
As we approached the humongous creature, I stopped in my tracks as it felt like the heavens had opened up and poured rain on top of us. I looked to Demi and realized that what covered us was not rain, but rather blood. Turning to the beast, I saw a bloody mess. Blood spurted from the missing chunk of what used to be Elizabeth's neck. Whether it had bitten or slashed her neck with its claws, it had left a gaping hole. She didn't even have time to scream. Before we could react, the beast swung a claw at Elizabeth's chest. It looked as if a piñata had been struck. Her clothes seemed to explode into confetti as the nails ripped through her stomach. She collapsed to her knees with a pool of her own blood. The beast then lifted her ever so effortlessly and buried its face into her. I could hear it feasting from where we stood and had the urge not to throw up the stew I had eaten. It pulled at her ribs and stomach, and again we were sprayed with bits of flesh and blood. There was a dull thud as it let her body fall to the ground. Her intestines fell next to her, seeming to catch her company. I heard yet another scream, but this scream was human. Demi quietly whispered, He's alive. I turned the flashlight ever so slightly to focus on Joseph. He had a huge gash on his chest, and the blood had soaked every bit of his clothes. He looked as if someone had dumped red water onto him. He had propped himself up against the trees and just bore witness to his fiancée being torn apart by an ungodly creature. The scream caught its attention and turned to Joseph to finish what it had started. The blood dripped from its face as it looked hungrily at my best friend. Part of me wanted to close my eyes. I could feel Demi shaking uncontrollably next to me, her arm gripping onto me, seemingly holding on for dear life. Deep down, I knew holding on to me was futile. Holding on for life seemed almost comical to me. I sure as shit couldn't save myself from this beast, let alone save my partner. What shall we do? Demi asked with a shaky breath. Honestly, we wait for it to go to Joseph and we run. I was blinded by the beam as Demi turned her flashlight towards me. The light seemed to burn my flesh in the darkness of the night. You're joking, right? She whispered angrily at me. We can't just wait for him to be savaged and hopefully we get away. We need to try something. I... I don't know what we could possibly do to this thing. It's a werewolf or something. I whispered back to her angrily. It seemed that my deep-rooted fear had turned to anger at the thought of not being able to run for my life. But deep down, I knew Demi was right. Part of me knew that we were going to die anyways, and so surely it was better to die trying to save Joseph than die like a coward. Also, if I managed to distract this spawn of hell, Demi might be able to get back to the house. Before we had time to react, the gleaming red eyes were looking down on the bloody mess that was Joseph. His scream had turned into the sadness and most pathetic whimper I had ever heard. Once again, my blood ran cold as the scream of the monster pierced the night sky, almost as if it was showing Joseph how to scream. Joseph's soaked clothes were made all the wetter by the drooling beast above him. It dripped blood and saliva on him, looking down on him as any apex predator would a defenseless creature it was ready to devour. The nightmare in front of us was not perturbed in the slightest by the beams trained on him by the flashlights. Demi and I both had our flashlights pointed directly at it, frozen in fear. One would have thought we were in a slasher film with the amount of blood spraying around us. Demi and I were drenched in the blood and bits of Elizabeth, but the trees keeping us boxed in were painted red with the life force of our friends. Adding to the red mess, the beast bent down and seized Joseph by the leg. Another scream echoed throughout the resting place of Elizabeth as Joseph bellowed in pain as his bones were undoubtedly crushed by the repulsive jaws that had torn apart his fiancée. 
and pushed through the tree line, dragging my best friend with him like a dog does with a bone. Joseph had stopped moving and was either dead or had lost all strength and drive to live. And I don't blame him. Our flashlights followed the creature as it moved, and we bore witness to Joseph's leg come clean off his body. As it dragged him into the abyss, the force it had used to torture Joseph by tearing his leg obviously proven to be too much, and the leg was being held on by nothing more than a few tendons. Joseph's big frame, although dwarfed by the creature, weighed him down enough to separate his leg from his body. The creature seemed content to have mauled at Joseph and continued its withdrawal, red eyes and daunting figure disappearing into the trees. The trees around us shook and cracked as the beast seemed to move in all directions around us. We stayed frozen. Unsure if we should run or stay where we were, debating if the sound of us moving would bring the nightmare back to us. The scream that we had heard it emit sounded again. This time, it sounded as if it was quite a distance away. How on earth could something move that quickly? I could feel my heart almost stop beating completely as a groan came from the mangled mess ahead of us. Somehow, Joseph was alive. Impulse took over, and I pulled Demi by the hand to him. Our flashlights bobbed as we made our way over the scattered flesh and puddles of blood. The silence surrounding us was deafening. Joseph looked nothing more than a heap of blood and shredded clothes. We casted our lights on his face, and his eyelids fluttered open ever so slightly. Blood covered his face completely. There was not a patch of skin not soaked in red. He coughed weakly and blood trickled down his chin. I couldn't but help draw the comparison to how both the predator and the prey both seemed to be drooling blood. His leg flowed like a fountain and the smell of metal filled the air around us. Goodbye pure fresh air. Holy shit. I managed to get out. We need to stop the bleeding, Demi ordered, seemingly having snapped out of her shock. I could barely move, and here she was, knowing exactly what to do in the face or muzzle of danger. Demi was crouched beside Joseph, boots soaked in the blood. I slipped my belt off my waist and settled it down beside her. We need to get out of here. We don't know where that thing is, I told Demi. We can't leave Joseph... He's still alive, she responded. How the hell are we going to carry him? I asked her in frustration. I never swore when speaking to Demi, and I guess fear brought out the worst in me. Let's stop the bleeding, and we'll cross that bridge when we get there. As we hooped the belt around the stump where the leg used to be, it made the most disgusting squishing sound. Blood poured profusely from the wound, and I thought our efforts were futile. Joseph groaned slightly as the belt tightened against his skin. There was nothing we could do about the gash in his chest, and I just hoped it would not cause him to bleed out as we devised a plan of action. Our hands looked as if we were operating on someone with no gloves. In that moment of helping Joseph, Demi and I both seemed to have forgotten about the menace that had launched this atrocious attack on our group. With Joseph somewhat patched up, there was nothing left to do besides decide what we would do. We can't be that far from the house, Demi reasoned with me. That may be the case, but Joseph weighs like a hundred kilos, I countered her argument with. We have to try. Please, this is crazy. What kind of people would we be if we just left him? She asked. Well, we would most probably be survivors if we left him. So alive. That's the kind of people we would be, I said with unintentional sarcasm. Grab his arms. We could carry him together, came her reply. He's going the slowest down, I said the Demi. We don't know where this creature is and when it will come back. We need to move as quickly as we can to get back to the house. Go on then, Demi screamed at me, obviously pissed. I'll drag him home myself. 
I felt as though I could have cried in that moment. I wanted nothing more than to curl up in a ball on the ground and just cry. I had progressed well past fear and was experiencing completely new feelings. Without another word, I stepped behind the upper half of the one-legged man and began scooping the mess into my arms. Joseph's head nodded from side to side as if he was agreeing with what we were doing. Demi made a concerted effort to be as gentle as she could to avoid knocking the secured stump. The task was hard as is, trying to pick up a person seemingly the size of a fridge. Demi was clearly giving everything she had and was struggling beyond measure. The absurd amount of blood covering all of us made the task almost impossible, factoring in that we had to put the flashlights under our arms to provide us with some light as we would begin our hobbling journey throughout the trees. We moved as best as we could along the path, straining more than I thought I ever could, while simultaneously doing all that we could do to keep as quiet as we could. Absolute silence. I could hear nothing but the faint breath coming from Joseph and the pain grunts from Demi as she scuffled alongside me. I nearly dropped Joseph when I heard the scream. I have never seen a demon, but I presume that's how a demon would scream if ever one did. The sound was much closer to us than the last time. It's back, I hissed at Demi. We need to move faster, she said, and with an almost movie-like burst of strength, started moving quicker than she did before. I matched her speed as to not disrupt the rhythm that we had going in our movement and had to resist the urge not to spin around and loom into the trees for the haunting red eyes. I stippled my scream when I could hear branches snapping and the trees very close behind us parting to make way for the monster. As terrified as I was, I was equally as thankful that the sounds were coming from the trees that were on my side of the path. If it spent as much time tearing me up as it did the others, it would give Demi the chance to hopefully make it back to the house. My thoughts were racing and a sense of dread and hopelessness washed over me. Why would we be safe in the house? This creature tore people apart effortlessly and ran dozens of miles in an instant. I had no doubt it would be able to get into the house. There was no time to think about that though. If at least Demi could make it back, she could use the satellite phone that we had seen in the living room to call for help. Hopefully, they could get to her in time. We definitely couldn't rely on the neighbors. The odds of them hearing us were zero. The creatures seemed to be taunting us. I had absolutely no doubt it was faster than us, but for some reason it just about kept pace with us. The branches continued snapping behind me, but Demi seemed unbothered by it and kept moving as quickly as she could. Her bravery encouraged me, and I ignored the menace giving chase, and plodded along as quickly as possible. Not too far ahead now, the lights left on and the house became visible. The hope I had lost returned at the sight of the lights. Maybe the woods had thickened to the point they were impenetrable, and the monster could not break through. Maybe it wouldn't be able to break down the thick door that led into the sanctuary that was a safe haven for the shredded man I now carried. If we could barricade ourselves in the bathroom, perhaps we would be okay. I knew Demi saw the lights, but her determination seemed to keep her silent, and she plowed along as she had done the whole time. Once we get off the path and the house is near, I want you to run as fast as you can. I'll drag Joseph by myself. That will slow you down even more. We have to do this together, she said in between each heavy breath. No, I said sternly. Our only chance is if you get to the house and call for help. Just look on the refrigerator for the emergency contact numbers. I'm not leaving you behind, she told me, even more sternly than I had. There's no point in both of us dying. If it attacks us, I'll try to hold it off as best I can. You always said you wanted to see my karate training. This is my chance to show you, I said jokingly, 
trying to make myself feel better about the suicide mission I was about to attempt. We can fight it together, she said shakily. We both know how that won't work out. Please, just get help, I asked her, extreme depression in my voice. Okay, came her hesitant reply. We scrambled off the trail, within a stone's throw from the house. We were finally so close. It had seemed like we trekked hundreds of miles, all the while being pursued by a beast that was going to rip us to pieces and dine on our insides. I braced myself and waited for the muscular limb of the creature to swipe at me and relieve me of a good portion of my body. Nothing hit me. I can't hear it anymore. Where did it go? I asked Demi nervously. I have no idea, but just keep moving. We kept the pace and neared the house. Once again, my doubts about the safety of the house came flooding back. If we sit in the house, we'll be waiting for our death, I prompted. So what should we do? Demi replied. Let's drive and get to the neighbors. We have no idea how long the authorities will take to get here. I'm sure in this kind of place the residents will have guns, I told her. She didn't need to say anything for me to know that she agreed with my suggestion. We finally reached the truck and I had never felt so relieved in my life. Demi lowered the leg she was carrying and threw open the passenger door. I stuffed Joseph in with no concern about his missing leg and pushed Demi to get inside. Running to the kitchen door we had entered upon arrival, I felt as if there was without an uncertainty that there was a god. The keys that were left right on the counter near the door. I picked them up and swiveled to my heels, heading back to the truck. I stood right where I thought it was going to attack us. The shine of the moon casted a brilliant beam down onto it, seeming to illuminate nothing but the beast. I knew it was huge from the encounter in the woods, but now I could see the extent of its size. It stood upright, muscles bulging all over its body as if it had dedicated its whole life to weightlifting. The claws that protruded from its hands hung menacingly at its side, the length of them making me think small knives had been stuck onto its hands. The glowing red eyes that had been an indicator of its presence, situated above the beastly snout we had seen covered in blood. Ears perked up like a German shepherd, it stared at us, not moving. In what felt like slow motion, I sprung into the driver's seat and jammed the keys into the ignition. I reversed with the speed and precision of a professional stunt driver and launched the car into first gear. The gravel kicked up around the tires, slowing us down. The truck picked up traction and accelerated as well as it could. Demi and I sat in shocked silence, disbelieving we had managed to get to the car least of all carrying a mammoth of a man slumped next to us. I veered to the side when I caught a glimpse of the red eyes bounded ever so close behind us. I knew it was too good to be true. The monster had given chase yet again, this time on the open road. The headlights illuminated the vast trees around us, and I wondered if driving into the thicket would do any good. Maybe I could slow it down and try to run the beast over. It was catching up very quickly, the engine straining on third gear. Engaging fourth gear and picking up speed, the gap between us and the beast seemed to be increasing. It was fast as hell, but the glory of modern mechanics seemed to be bettering it. Out of what I presume must have been an irritation, the demon scream rang through my ears. It did not let up the speed, and I heard Demi began to sob quietly as we climbed over a slight hill, and we gazed upon the lights of a house not too far from where we were. It's okay, babe. There's going to be people there. We're going to make it. It can't keep up with the car. I reassured her. I checked the rearview mirror, and no longer saw the red eyes that chased us unrelenting. We've lost it. Look behind us. It's gone, 
I told Demi. I didn't have time to react when the flash of fur bursted through the tree line. It collided with the front of the car with the force of a tank and sent us off course towards the trees. As my head connected to the steering wheel, again I heard the scream as I felt my eyes close. I did my best to keep them open, but the blood pouring from the split in my head assisted them with closing. Don't move, buddy. Just stay still, the light said to me. It felt as if there was an axe in my head. Why would heaven have pain? Maybe I had gone to hell. You guys all right? We got you, another voice sounded from the brightness. Once again, I felt my eyes grow heavy and the darkness began to consume me. Maybe the bright light was purgatory. And now it was time to see if I was destined for eternal life or eternal condemnation. I finally woke up, my head banging like a marching band had taken up residence inside. I turned slowly, groaning in pain. What? What happened? I asked the figure standing not too far from where I seemed to be laying. It nearly got you. We saw your headlights and stepped outside. We don't get many visitors, so we thought it was strange. We rushed over as soon as we saw the lights head towards the trees, the voice said as it turned to me. My vision was blurry, and I could just about make out the massive beard covering my savior's face. Where's Demi? I asked, doing my best to sit up. Easy, fella, the beard said to me. Your missus is fine. She's laying down in the other bed over here. We've done the best we can with the other guy. The ambulance should be here soon to take you guys to the hospital. What the hell is that thing? What did that to us? Where, where is it? I asked him in a panic. It's gone now. We know how to get it to stop what it's doing, but it only works for a little bit. Once it's gone, you gotta get away as soon as you can. You know what it is? I asked him. Of course. We've been dealing with it for generations. We do our best to avoid it, and it doesn't come to us. As they say, prevention is better than cure. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for helping us, I sobbed, letting my emotions flow freely. We tried talking to your buddy about it, but he always seemed to be busy. We never got the chance to warn him. If he had taken the time to hear us, he could have avoided this, unfortunately. We know its routine and how it functions, he informed me. We normally head out for the year and leave the houses empty when we know it's going to be hunting, he continued. How on earth can you possibly know when it's going to be active? I asked. Because it doesn't change. Every ten years it plagues these lands. My great-granddaddy saw it first, set traps, and was killed by it. Ever since then, my family has passed down what to do when it rears its ugly head. But for the most part, it's safer to just take off and just leave it be. Um, so what exactly is it? I asked, knowing we had to leave this godforsaken place. No one knows exactly what it is, but we call it the Dogman. I took my son Jared camping a few years ago down in Lake Jennings, which is located in Lakeside, California. It is about a 15-minute drive west of Alpine, which is a small, rural mountain town. Lake Jennings is a wonderful place to camp by tent or by RV, but this story takes place when we went camping there by tent. My wife and daughter stayed behind on this trip, as I wanted to teach my son some survival training to get him ready to go into the Boy Scouts. I grew up being a Boy Scout and loved every moment of it until I discovered driving and girls. Then, my attention steered another direction. My boy was very much interested in the outdoors, 
our home, sits at the edge of the woods in northern San Diego County, and he's always in the backyard roaming around and getting lost and finding things that he would bring back to the house to show me. This is when I knew it was time to prep the young lad for Boy Scouts, and to do a little bit of training. I also planned on being a parent volunteer as well on their overnight adventures and selling events at the local mall, where they sell things like popcorn and other sorts of goodies, which the funding goes towards the organization. I went a tad off topic, uh, let's get back to what actually happened. It was only an overnight stay at the campground. I wanted to show him things like setting up a tent, gathering firewood, and how to start a fire using kindling and not using any lighter fluid, etc. I actually gathered some cotton swabs that my wife uses from the bathroom, and some old dryer lint from the laundry room, placing them all in a small Ziploc bag along with some Vaseline as it's very flammable. Before you judge me, just know I used what I had at the time, and my son was only six back then. Once we arrived at the campsite and found the lot and parked, I unpacked all of our belongings and started showing my son how to set up the tent, which ended up taking around 40 minutes, give or take. Then we set up everything regarding food and snacks and drinks on the picnic table and bench. Of course, I had the fishing poles out too with my tackle box to teach my young man a thing or two about fishing. We were, after all, at the lake, so that went without saying. The first order of business after setting up our shelter was breakfast. By preparing breakfast, it would give me the chance to show Jared how to light a fire. We crouched together over the area designated for fires, and I set down the small twigs and kindling to birth the flame. Jared stared intently as I worked and explained the process to him. I could almost see cogs turning in his head as he listened to me. I could tell you he was taking this very seriously and the delight on his face made me smile when I told him that I would be relying on him to make the fire later for us to make our next meal. Once the fire was going, I set two pans down to make eggs and warm up the beans. Quick, easy, and convenient if you ask me. We scuffed the meal down in silence, both of us in awe and admiration at the sounds of the great outdoors, the rustling of the trees, the fresh gusts of wind, and of course the chirping of the vast number of birds flying around. The air itself seemed infinitely purer than the air we had to breathe in the city. Breaks like these really made you appreciate the beauty of nature. Bellies full and spirits high, I told Jared we best get some fishing in before the day progressed any further. It's not good fishing in the blaring sun, and also it would be good to have your next meal ready to cook in the setting of surviving out here. We carried the fishing poles and tackle boxes and made our way to the edge of the water. The crystal clear water was jaw-dropping, with the sun and sky looking down to give the vast water the illusion of color. We settled down, took out the bait, and I carefully showed Jared how to set up his pole. My heart beamed with pride as my son effortlessly prepared his pole, just as I had done. I taught him to cast, and once again, he did it seamlessly. I couldn't resist and gently tussled his hair and smiled lovingly at him. He smiled back and I could see the comfort and enjoyment on his face. Jared didn't need me to tell him that silence was imperative, so we sat in silence once again, side by side. We had an ice box filled with ice cubes and before long, I had caught a pretty decent sized fish. Well, lunch is sorted, I said to Jared. Hopefully you managed to catch us some dinner, I told him. What happens if we don't catch any more fish, Dad? He asked me quietly. Unfortunately, we won't eat dinner then, I told him jokingly. The despair on his face made my heart ache, and I had to tell him that it was a joke, and we had more than enough food brought from home to survive. This seemed to soothe him, and he settled back down once again to continue his leisurely fishing. Soon enough, I had caught a couple more fish and added them to the ice box. No sooner that I had set the lid back on, did I hear my son shrieking with excitement. I got one, Dad! I got one! He shouted with pure bliss, you only find in the innocent. 
There on his pole was the smallest fish you had ever seen. He was absolutely jubilant at his victory. Hold your pole up. Let me take a picture. I told him proudly. Fish squirming in the air, he held the pole and I snapped a picture on my phone. Usually, I would release the smaller fish back into the water, but I couldn't bring myself to release the fish he had caught. I figured, what harm would keeping one fish do? With the fix in the icebox and smiles on our faces, we set back off towards the campsite. Once we arrived, I showed Jared how to gut and prepare the fish for when we cooked it later. Luckily, my boy wasn't squeamish. He didn't look away at all, even when the fish guts had plastered the tree stump I was cleaning them on. The rest of the day was as perfect as the morning had been. I showed Jared how to set traps and catch small animals, of which we let them go, but I wanted him to know how to set them. He had learned this as quickly as he did everything else that I had taught him, and I couldn't have been prouder. Night soon fell, and it was time for his big test. We huddled together as we did in the morning, and Jared put together everything he needed to build the fire. It took him a couple of tries, but eventually, I saw the spark and the kindling caught ablaze. I think I was more excited for this than he was, and I once again felt the unshakable feeling of being a proud dad. Once the fire was going and the fish was cooking, we sat staring into the flames, silence shared by us, listening to nature. This time, I noticed a difference from the morning. It was silent around us. There were no sounds coming from the trees, no calls of animals. There was not even a breath of wind. The silence made me feel uneasy, and so I asked Jared if he had enjoyed the day's activities. We reflected on the day and laughed together while the food cooked, and I soon felt the unease dissipate. Before I knew it, the fish were ready and we thoroughly enjoyed the food we had caught with our very own hands. Well, with the fishing pole, too. Our bellies were once again full, and we sat admiring our surroundings. It was only then that I heard a sound. The deafening silence was broken by an even louder noise of something moving amongst the trees and snapping branches. The sudden sound frightened me, and it obviously did Jared, as he asked me with a shaking voice, What was that, Dad? Not knowing for sure, but realizing that it must have been something big and heavy with the incredible speed, I told Jared to relax and there are many animals found out here, so there is no need to panic. I knew there was a ranger's office about 15 minutes away. The path to the car wasn't treacherous, and so we could easily navigate it with our flashlights. Once in the car park, it was but a short walk to the ranger's. Dad... I'm scared, Jared said to me. I could not tell my son that I was scared too, and so I calmly suggested that we return to the car for his peace of mind. What about our tent, Dad? He asked me. Don't worry about the tent. We could come back and get everything in the morning, I told Jared. The feeling of unease had not only returned, but had turned into unadulterated fear forget the tents. We could drive back tomorrow in the day and collect them. I took my son's hand and walked with him onto the path to take us home. Those eyes. Those red demon eyes. As I turned back to look at our campsite, I saw them. Hidden in the thicket of trees, they burned brightly in the darkness. I could not make out a shape but I could see those ungodly red eyes. Panic took over me, and I picked my son up and ran. I couldn't bring myself to look back. I just ran as fast as my adrenaline-fueled body would run. I could hear whatever that thing was in the trees surrounding us. Between the thumping in my chest and the thuds of my feet, I couldn't distinguish where the sound was coming from. As I made my way down the path, the red eyes once again materialized, this time in the trees ahead of me. 
I was nearly through into the car park. I pushed myself even harder to get just a little bit more speed. The darkness around me seemed to close in as my flashlight bounced with my stride. Would the darkness completely envelop us and leave us helpless? As my thoughts began to run away from me, I realized I had started screaming. Jared was crying in my arms, obviously aware something was gravely wrong. I screamed at the top of my lungs, imploring for someone, maybe even a higher power, to save us. We bursted from the trail into the car park. It was not hard to spot our car, as it was the only car that remained. I looked back, my stomach dropping, and expected the red eyes to be behind me. The darkness looked back at me. There was nothing. I'm going to get the ranger. Stay sitting on the floor of the car and don't get up until you hear my voice. I told Jared, my voice trembling. No, Dad, please don't leave me alone, came his desperate plea. I figured if Jared stayed hidden in the car and I continued on to the rangers while screaming... Whatever was attached to those haunting red eyes would follow me and leave Jared alone. I think Jared knew how grave and serious the situation was, as he didn't say anything else as I opened the car and lowered him in, covering him with jackets we had left in the vehicle. With tears in my eyes, full of fear, I continued running. I could hear the creature now. A low, deep snarl came from the trees around me. It kept pace with me, almost mocking me that my absolute fastest speed was nothing to it. I screamed as loud as I could, praying to myself. I just hoped that even if this creature attacked me, it would leave Jared alone. My screams must have been heard as my lone flashlight was soon met by another beam. Hey! What's going on? Shouted a sturdy voice not far in front of me. I had made it to the ranger. Help! I saw these red eyes at our campsite and ran here to get you. I don't know what kind of creature it is, but I don't know what else to do. I sobbed to the man. Have you been drinking, sir? He asked concerned. And is there anybody else with you? I explained to him that I was as sober as could be, and begged him to come to my car as my boy was waiting there for me. The ranger walked towards me, the barrel of his shotgun glistening in the light of my flashlight. I'll escort you back to the vehicle, sir, he assured me. The red eyes seemed to have disappeared after taunting me. As we walked down the path, I felt my breathing start to return to normal. I was feeling immensely more comfortable knowing that this expert of the outdoors was accompanying me, most importantly with the weapon to defend us. He didn't speak, and I was more than happy to walk in silence. We approached the clearing and led to the car park, and as we broached the trees, my blood ran cold. I couldn't move. The deafening crack of the rifle brought me back to reality and I felt my legs give out on me. What the hell is that? The ranger screamed at me, firing a second shot towards the red eyes. Except this time, it was not just the red eyes. I could see the owner of the eyes. It stood taller than any man I had ever seen, with thick fur covering its entire body. The car park lights shone onto the creature, but it looked like the lights were sucked in by the evil. It turned to us, hardly phased by the shots directed at it. And that's when I saw my son. The creature was holding him by the legs, and they were both covered in blood. The dim light illuminated his body enough to see that his arms had been torn off his body, and the blood poured from the stumps where they once been. His head lollied about with every movement the red-eyed devil made. His eyes glared at me, seemingly blaming me for what had happened. Blood seeping from its mouth and nose, his throat had been ripped open, and I could see it was not even held together by much. This thing had nearly decapitated my poor boy. There was so much blood. 
I had never seen so much blood in my life. I couldn't protect my boy. I thought I was doing the right thing by drawing the red eyes towards me. How wrong I was. My son had been torn apart and there was nothing I could do about it. The scream the creature let loose sounded somewhat human, but more like a mass of tortured people screaming in unison. I don't know why the beast left us alive. I question why it ran off with the remains of my boy. When the police and journalists arrived, there was nothing but the destroyed vehicle and blood that had been sprayed all over, draining the life from Jared. The police took our statements and launched a search for the body and what they insisted must have been a wolf. My wife and daughter were beside themselves. They blamed me for Jared's death. They left me and moved to England to be with my wife's family. I don't blame them. Now I sit and drink to not feel anything. To not remember anything. Nobody believes us. But we know what we saw. I still see those damned red eyes in my dreams. I was hired about 12 years ago to trap and hunt these wild hogs that has been plaguing this farmer's land for quite some time. If you know anything about hogs, is that they can get quite big, and they're very aggressive. What I would typically do, and what I've done in the past, is I'd set up random traps around the property. These traps would basically be a circular fence about 30 feet in diameter. The fence would have a gate that would close shut after a certain amount of hogs would be in the trap, I set up three traps like this on the property in order to maximize what I could catch. I set up my traps and I waited through the night to see what I would catch. The next morning I took my horse out and checked the traps. The first two were empty. The last trap had about seven hogs in it, all of which were pretty good size. I didn't do anything with the last trap and I left the hogs alone. In order for me to reset the trap, I'd have to kill all of the hogs, haul them out of there, and reset it. I would not be able to haul all of the hogs out with just my horse. I'd need my truck for that. I rode my horse back, dropped it off, and picked up my truck, and went out for the third trap. Upon arriving to the third trap, the hogs were in a frenzy. Something must have stirred them up while I was gone. I noticed that some of the hogs were injured and had blood on them. This wasn't necessarily surprising. Hogs would not only injure, but also kill and eat other hogs, if given the chance. But upon counting the hogs, I noticed that two of them had gone missing. Instead of seven hogs, there were only five. My only conclusion was that I either miscounted, or two of them had escaped. At this point, it didn't even cross my mind that something had taken them. The only animal that I could think of that could do that was maybe a bear which we weren't in bear country, so I figured that i just miscounted. I killed the five hogs, reloaded the trap, and loaded the hogs back into my truck. I had a special ramp on the back of my truck bed that I'd used to pull the hogs into. Some of these hogs weighed 200 pounds, and there's no way I could do this by myself unless I had a ramp. I drove back and checked the other two traps before calling it a day. To be honest, I was kind of confused about the two missing hogs. Did I really miscount? I can understand if it was 20 or 30 hogs, but 7? Seven? 7 isn't that high of a number. At this point, my common sense told me that these two hogs just slipped away, and that was that. The next day came and I checked the traps again on horseback. The first two traps had hogs in them, which was really good news. The first one only had 4, while the second one had 12. What this meant was that the hogs were being drawn out from the woods, coming closer and closer to my traps, and falling for it. This made my job a lot easier. I went and checked my third and final trap, the trap that was the deepest in the woods, and to my surprise, there weren't any hogs inside of it. I was quite surprised that there weren't any hogs in this trap. If there were to be a trap that had hogs in it, it'd be this one. After quickly inspecting the trap, I noticed that the trap had shut, meaning something had triggered it, but there weren't any hogs inside. 
When I went to reset the trap, I noticed bits and pieces of hogs all over the inside of the trap. Normally when hogs eat one another, there's a remaining hog standing, a last survivor. What had eaten these hogs? And more importantly, how did it get out of the trap? The trap's fence was about seven feet tall, even tall for me. Granted, the fence was chain-linked, meaning that I could climb out of it, but I don't know of any animal that could do that. Some animal jumping seven feet that lives in America doesn't sound realistic. Again, I was confused about this third trap, but then again I just reset the trap and went about my day. The third day came and I checked the traps again. The first two traps in total had 20 hogs. I was quite anxious to see what the third trap would have. For a second day in the row, the trap had been closed, but there were no hogs inside. Again, there were bits and pieces of hogs that remained, but no live ones. Something must have been eating them. I checked the inside of the traps for tracks of any kind, but the hogs' footprints had damaged the soil too much that I couldn't see anything. It finally clicked in my mind that it was probably a cougar, a large one. I asked the farmer for permission to hunt the cougar at night, which he agreed. He didn't want the cougar eating any of his livestock. I reset all three traps, and I waited for nightfall. Cougars are nocturnal animals, for the most part, and like to hunt at night. I decided that riding my horse out would be the best option. My truck would be too distracting and would scare off the cougar. I waited till 1am to go hunting. This would give my traps enough time to catch some hogs, which would be perfect bait for this cougar. 1am came around, and I took off on horseback. All I brought with me was my rifle and a heavy-duty flashlight. This was before the time of smartphones, and I obviously didn't own any night vision goggles. Looking back, this was really dumb. At the very least, I should at least brought someone with me. But I didn't. I rode past the first two traps and on my way to the third one, when I started to hear the sounds of wild hogs squealing. I knew that I was right on time to catch the cougar in the act. I quickly rode out to the third trap, flashlight in hand. When I first arrived to the trap, I didn't know what I was looking at. All I saw were wild hogs running around crazily inside the trap. However, I did notice something very large inside that didn't look like a hog. Instead of pulling out my rifle, I just sat there looking at what kind of creature was inside this trap. My flashlight must have caught the creature's attention, and it stopped what it was doing and stood up. The best way I could describe it was that it was like a dog, but also human at the same time. Its features resembled that of a werewolf or a very large dog standing on two legs, and I was completely terrified. My horse, being confused and frightened, took off back the way we came. I could see now that the creature was ignoring the hogs, and its attention was on us. I heard the sound of something jumping over a fence and giving chase behind us. I urged my horse to run faster, but it was too slow for this thing. The creature made a couple swipes at my horse, which my horse reacted in pain. My horse had significantly slowed, and the creature was able to gain. The creature tackled the horse from behind, causing me to be bucked off. My horse and my rifle were now in the clutches of this large beast. The beast was now eating my horse, and I had no choice but to run. Thankfully, I wasn't too far away, and I was able to make it back safely. The creature seemed to be pretty satisfied with my horse, and thankfully it didn't chase me. If it did, I would not be able to be here today telling you my story. <laughs>